We'll have the uh, honor guard come in. I'm assuming, yes. Um, the, uh, we are going to try to be out of here by 1 o'clock. Uh, folks who wanted to speak have to sign up, and at some point that list is going to close. The, uh, so if you haven't signed up and you really want to speak, you need to make sure you're on the list now, and I believe that list is out in the front. Um, we're going to begin, even though the mayor is not here yet, she had called and said she's on her way, and we should begin. Um, and there'll be a couple of changes, which I guess I will explain at the, um, after we have the uh, honor guard and the Pledge of Allegiance. So if you would all rise for the honor guard. <coughs> Please be seated. <coughs> Before I turn to my colleagues here, I just want to mention a couple of things. Uh, comments close tonight at midnight. Uh, testimony can be submitted online until then, and the online address is in the uh, materials that have been handed out. The parliamentarian today is Fred Cook. Uh, the seats next to the microphone are for those who are next to testify. Uh, what we uh, have is, uh, I'm going to turn to my colleagues in a moment, then Mr. Cook will come forward, uh, explain the rules of engagement, then we will hear from several speakers, uh, including Carl Racine, who's our Attorney General, Walter Smith, uh, Keith Perry, uh, Luis Torres, uh, Kim Keenan, Mark Plotkin, and also Councilmember Nadeau. Um, and I don't think I said that in the order that everybody will be recognized. I think Councilmember Nadeau will be after the Attorney General. Um, and then we will have opportunity for resident testimony and discussion. 
and the microphone will be there. Those who are speaking, the names I just read, will come up here. And, um, uh, but then there's a microphone over there, and uh, I believe Senator Strauss is going to take over in a minute because we're trying to share the responsibilities <coughs> here. And um, so he will be calling folks forward. Uh, with that, let me turn to my colleagues, ask if they have anything, any remark, opening remarks. Uh, Senator Strauss? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's again an honor and a privilege to be here as we convene this third and final session of our Constitutional Convention. I want to keep my remarks brief today because this is really about hearing from you, the delegates to this convention, the citizens of the District of Columbia. We appreciate you being here. We appreciate those who stayed late with us last night. We appreciate those who are here early with us this Saturday morning. Uh, and uh, thank you for sharing this historic process with us. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> We're here today to hear testimony about the Constitution. Uh, we've been at this now for a little over two months. We've heard a lot of comments. Um, some people have a little bit of a problem with the process. Uh, we're, we hear everything you're saying, and <clears throat> I myself have been critical of some of the things that have gone on here. But we've got to remember that this is not a perfect process. We can't kill the good in search of the perfect. We need to get this on the ballot. Uh, we have over 300, we have almost 300 comments here from people. There's been more enthusiasm about this initiative than anything I've been involved in since I've been involved in the statehood movement, and that's been 10 years now. So I encourage everybody to step up to the microphone. Let us know how you feel. Let us take your... Uh, comments into consideration and let's move forward with this because this is our time um, we've got a president that says i'm for it we've got two democratic candidates who one is a co-sponsor of our bill in the in the house and the senate and one has said uh, uh my candidate hillary clinton said she's going to fight for this when she becomes president so now is our time let's make sure that we get this done and we get it on the ballot. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much. Uh, uh, good morning, everybody. Yesterday, <coughs> last night, we had a very large turnout. Uh, we had this place uh, half full, and um, we're hoping that today we have a similar turnout. Uh, wanted to uh, recognize uh, uh, Robert White, uh, who uh, is an incredible advocate for statehood and uh, just won the Democratic primary. Uh, thank you so much. Um, also want to thank all the technicians who uh, are putting this together so that we can have the comfort of the wonderful sound and we can go online and watch these hearings over and over. Thank you for doing such a great job. Uh, and lastly, also want to thank uh, all these interns that we have in our office who are also doing, uh, making sure that all these things uh, get uh, in the right place. So thank you so much and just very excited to be here as we come to the end of this, uh, I guess, the citizen participatory process, uh, we're looking forward to seeing all the comments and putting them in a way that uh, can be addressed to uh, make some changes to the draft constitution. So thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, under the rules of our commission, as the ranking member, I generally only preside in the absence of either the mayor or the chair, but uh, I appreciate you yielding to me and allowing uh, this responsibility and opportunity to participate in this truly historic occasion uh, to be shared amongst uh, the members of the delegation. Uh, let me bring up our parliamentarian, Mr. Fred Cook, uh, who will address the uh, rules of the day. Uh, Mr. Cook, you could enter the stage from either stair. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you for being here with us this morning, Councilor. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And uh, thank you, Commission members, for affording me this opportunity. I uh, just want to say uh, that I'm happy to be here uh, as a lifelong resident of the District of Columbia and uh, a person who has been involved in the effort for statehood for a while. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to see this effort uh, ongoing and uh, am optimistic that uh, these efforts will, will bear fruit. Um, as some of you 
most of you hopefully know, we were embarked on a statehood effort uh, following what's frequently referred to as the Tennessee Plan. That is to say, uh, the plan by which Tennessee was admitted to the Union in 1796. And that, uh, that effort fundamentally requires that the citizen of a, citizens of an area that wish to become a state uh, do four things. Uh, they evidence their desire to become a state through some sort of vote by the people. They adopt a constitution that is uh, that has a representative form of government. They have legal boundaries that they've established, and we've had some a presentation from the uh, Office of Planning that has a meets and bounds description of the new state uh, that will be uh, founded. And um, the citizens again vote, and this whole thing is designed to produce a vote amongst the citizens of the District of Columbia in November of this year. And that package will then be sent on to the Congress of the United States for action by the Congress. It's important through this process that citizens participate, provide input into that document which will be the Constitution for the new state. And we're going to talk a little bit now about um, what some of the guiding principles that we have been uh, using to shape our Constitution. Uh, as you know, there was a Constitution uh, ratified by the citizens of the District of Columbia in 1982. Uh, there was a second Constitution enacted by the Council, but not ratified by the citizens in 1987. Since 1987, there have been a number of structural changes in the government of the District of Columbia, uh, most notably the creation by the citizens uh, of the office of an elected attorney general. There has in the interim been the imposition of a control board, uh, which was not done by the citizens of the District of Columbia, probably done to the citizens of the District of Columbia. But in any event, that position, that the office of the chief financial officer, was created in our government. So uh, a number of us who were advising the Statehood Commission uh, advised that we needed to update our Constitution. Uh, to accommodate these changes that had happened since 1987 at least. And uh, so we have tried to do that, and we've been tried to have uh, been guided by a number of principles that in creating or modifying or adjusting the 1987 version of the Constitution, we have uh, tried to Im implement changes that promote, this, promote stability by maintaining the district's basic current governing structure we want to build upon the work of statehood efforts in the 1980s, but simplify and modernize the Constitution. We want to establish the structures necessary for good government. We want to empower the legislature and executive to govern in the interests of the people who elect them. We want to produce orderly and responsible governance. We want to reflect the values of district residents, and we want to demonstrate that the district merits congressional admission as a state, because at the end of the day, this process requires approval by the Congress of the United States, the House and the Senate. So with that, um, we've embarked on this process, uh, and this week have had a series of constitutional conventions that today, uh, as you were told earlier, is the last of, of those three. And for purposes of this uh, convention, we have a, a series of rules of engagement. This convention, as all the others, is nonpartisan. That is to say, this is not about a Democrat or a Republican or a statehood or a green thing. This is a nonpartisan um, convention, and we would, we would expect that attendees would respect all the views expressed by persons of whatever political persuasion they might be. The commissioners of the New Columbia Statehood Commission will chair all the sessions as they are doing this one. Uh, each session has a topic assigned, and uh, this topic for this uh, event is Article 3 of the Constitution, that is to say the, the judicial branch, Article 7, which is miscellaneous, and Article 8 are the transfers of offices from the current government to the state government. The third rule for this convention is that all residents of the District of Columbia are deemed to be delegates. All of you are delegates to the convention. All of you have the opportunity to provide input. All of you have the opportunity to provide comment. 
Testimony will follow the rules established in the public engagement process adopted by the New Columbia Statehood Commission, which is to say individual speakers will have three minutes to testify and organizations will have five minutes. Delegates uh, may also submit written testimony up to three pages for individuals and five pages for organizations. An individual can only testify once during um, each session. All comments will be given equal weight for review by the New Columbia Statehood Commission. I'd just like to reemphasize that, that all comments, whether the comments are made here today, uh, orally, whether comments are submitted in writing, whether com comments are submitted via email, uh, whether you stop one of the commissioners in the grocery store and tell him uh, or her what, the, what you want, <coughs> all comments will be considered. All comments have the same weight. There's no prioritization in that regard. Uh, online testimony will be given equal weight to in-person testimony. The ultimate decision of all amendments and comments will be that of the New Columbia Statehood Commission by a majority vote. And final approval of the Constitution will be determined by the voters on the November 8 uh, election. So those are the rules by which we hope to uh, move this, forward pro this process forward today. And uh, hopefully we will, uh, at a point in the future, uh, produce a constitution that you and other citizens can vote on. As Mr. Mendelson said, the comment period will be closed at a date that is yet to be tonight. determined. Tonight. tonight? tonight. Okay, tonight. tonight. The comment period will, will it, it closes the comment period. Midnight. Midnight. So if you have comments of whatever type, they need to be in by midnight tonight. And uh, unless anybody has any questions, uh, I think I've confused everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor. Well done. <laughs> Our next speaker is the first elected Attorney General of the District of Columbia. And let me just say, as Mr. Carl Racine comes up, uh, I remember when we were voting on whether to amend our charter. Uh, I was part of that charter committee, and one of the things that we felt was so important, not just to have an independent attorney general, uh, but a lot of us felt that uh, this was one step closer to statehood. And um, indeed, it has proven uh, to be just that. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for serving as our first elected attorney general, Mr. Carl Racine. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, first and foremost, residents of the District of Columbia, uh, the Commission, uh, Mr. Chairman, representatives, and uh, the Senators, um, and of course, uh, Mayor Bowser's team. Uh, in particular, I want to really uh, give a shout out before I get started uh, to uh, the Mayor's Senior Counsel, Beverly Perry, uh, who's been indefatigable uh, in this effort. <laughs> You know, and like all excellent staff, uh, as you know, the interns, you do your work um, sometimes without any public acclaim, though, of course, you'll get criticized for it. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for leading us uh, throughout this, uh, Ms. Perry. Uh, good morning, District of Columbia. My name is Carl Racine, and I have the privilege of serving as the district's first elected attorney general. It is a great honor to speak to you this morning very briefly about the important business of building a legally sound constitution on the road to statehood. The convention and the constitution we're engaged in writing is a crucial step on the road toward statehood. But as we all know, we've been well on our way to building a healthy, robust, democratic state government for years now. Let's look at the evidence. That's what lawyers do. For more than 15 years now, we've balanced our budget, certainly something that positively distinguishes us from our congressional overseers. In fact, in fact, with repeated annual surpluses and fully funded pension programs, our finances are the envy of virtually every other city and state in the nation. We've bolstered the integrity of our government, strengthening our ethics laws, and rooting out corruption. We have more to do 
on that front. And I know uh, with the support of the residents of the District of Columbia, we will enact legislation that does just that. We've vastly improved our government services, ending court oversight in multiple cases over multiple agencies, improving our school system, and providing innovative new services that, we've, um, that we have imitated by our peer states, that have been imitated by our peer states. We have more to do on that front, and I'm sure with an active citizenry will accomplish significant improvement in the future. And we've taken one of the final steps that bring us in line with 43 other states, and that is establishing an independent office of Attorney General that is absolutely, every day, directly accountable to the public. If it weren't so offensive, I'd find it fascinating that people so frequently tell the district that we haven't earned the right to statehood. But let's just say, for the sake of argument, that we should have to earn that right to statehood. Don't you think we've made an extraordinarily strong case for it? <laughs> yeah. And I think that more than 10,000 net new residents are moving to the District of Columbia every year proves our point. People are moving here because they want to be part of an extraordinary, exciting, innovative, dynamic community that is the District of Columbia. Now I mentioned the establishment of the Office of Attorney General as an independent entity and as an important mile marker on the road to statehood. An independent attorney general charged with protecting the public interest provides the checks and balances necessary for an accountable, robust, and healthy democratic form of government. As many of you know, there have been some tensions as we've worked out this new form of government. But even this healthy tension is the mark of a robust democracy. It means residents have multiple avenues to have their voices heard and their elected officials must listen. And accountability to the public by the officials charged with executing and interpreting our laws is crucial. The Office of Attorney General is taking part in the process to provide the assistance necessary to ensure our draft constitution is legally sound and embodies all the best practices and principles we know from well-organized state governments. Those principles, as Mr. Cook um, articulated well, are the separation of powers, accountability, and sufficient representation. That's the Office of Attorney General's role in this process. Your role now is to stand up and demand statehood. People say the residents of the district don't actually care that much about statehood. They say that when it counts, we don't really turn out, that they see the same advocates year after year. Well, now is the time to dispel that notion. Frederick Douglass once said, power concedes nothing without a demand. This is our opportunity to speak with one voice to the nation and to demand statehood. So I urge you this morning to make that demand, and as you do, the Office of Attorney General is here to ensure that that demand is consonant with the principles of our national constitution and the broader principles of a healthy and robust democracy. Demand statehood. Thank you, Mr. Racine. Our next speaker will be Walter Smith, the Executive Director of the Appleseed Foundation. I'm sorry, uh, no, Council Member Brianne Nadeau. Thank you and good morning, everybody. Good morning. The Attorney General is too polite sometimes. I call them, I often call them our congressional overlords. Um, so I have been talking about statehood a lot lately. Um, and my favorite place to do that is in our elementary schools. And so I was talking to a group of second graders the other day and second graders are actually, they're at that point where they're starting to learn about civics 
and they have lots of exciting ideas. They were giving me lots of ideas for the Constitution, so I'll be passing those along, um, along the lines of more candy, those sorts of things. <laughs> but you know, when you're talking to young people in that age group, you really have to, to be very direct, right? And one of the things that I always start off by asking the children is, do you believe that everyone in America deserves the same rights and representation as everyone else? Raise your hand. And of course, right, they raise their hands, although there's always one or two, right? <laughs> From Maryland, usually. Um, in any case, not hating on Maryland, we need their help for lots of things, but, but it's very basic. Right? It's a very basic principle. If you live in this country, you should have the same rights as your neighbor in any other state, city, or you know, any neighborhood. And we believe that very strongly in the District of Columbia. You can see that in the way that we welcome our immigrant community um, and how we fought for equality for all of our residents over the years. Um, and so it's something that I've been carrying around with me and, and talking with these young people about. And I'll tell you that they also get excited about the idea that they might someday have their own star on that flag over there. Um, and it's a really powerful thing. But this week I've also been thinking a lot about gun violence and thinking a lot about how different it would be for the people of District of Columbia if we had voting members of the Senate could participate in this dialogue. Um, and I, I, I mentioned that no, not only because of what happened in Orlando last weekend, but also because of the violence that we see on our streets every day. We had two very violent incidents in Ward 1 this week. Very, very upsetting, not only for the people involved and, and their families, but also all of our residents who really want to feel every day like we live in a safe community. And we've always had tough laws in the district. We've always had smart policy but it continually is undermined by Congress and by the courts. And until we have statehood, and until we have voices in the House and the Senate that can vote for us on these issues, we are not gonna move forward. We are not. And so that's what I carry with me today um, as we meet. Um, and I wanna tell you I've also been traveling quite a bit lately to spread the message about statehood. I realized last year uh, in partnership with some of our statehood coalition friends that there are other places we can have voices. So I've been at the National Conference of State Legislatures, I've been at the Young Elected Officials Network, I've been at the Democratic Municipal Officials Network, and uh, everywhere I go, I talk to them about statehood, and, and it goes something like this. If it's a Democrat, the person says, right, we should get you statehood, let's do it. And if it's a Republican, it's a little more complicated. The other day I was in a conversation with one of my colleagues from Mississippi and he said to me, well, DC's not a state in the Constitution. I said, was Mississippi? <laughs> Thought about that for a little while. I think I might have got him in the end. You can, you can imagine how fun it is for the Democrats at these, these meetings to watch me chase around the Republicans with my arguments. And by the end, the Democrats can make the arguments with me because they're listening and they understand what we're going through. You don't need to hear me list out all the reasons that we deserve full representation. Um, you know, uh, one that moves me the most is that, our, is, is that our people go and fight and serve in the military. Um, my, my fiance is a veteran and I think about that a lot, um, the service that he did in Afghanistan. Um, and he'll soon be a DC resident as well. So, you know, these are the things that I, that I really am out there talking about. And I just want you to know that I'm excited to be here today to hear from all of you. I'm excited that there was such a robust discussion last night. Um, today's efforts are really important in moving us forward. And I promise you that I will continue to be fighting for statehood everywhere I go. Um, it's important to me also to mention how excited I am that we have a presidential nominee, the Democrats have a presidential nominee who has been so strong on this and that we may just have a woman president who's gonna help us move this forward. So I thank you all very much uh, for giving me a few minutes. Um, uh, Commission, I appreciate it. And uh, I thank you for all the work that you're doing and look forward to a great discussion today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councilwoman Nadeau. And thank you in particular for your leadership at the National Conference of State Legislatures, the young elected officials. Uh, it's critical that we continue to make uh, outreach there. 
Uh, we have been joined by, uh, you talked about the first woman president, we have been joined by the first woman governor, soon to be, <laughs> of uh, the new state. Uh, <clears throat> our commission chair, Mayor Bowser. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. And I want to thank everybody for being here today and uh, the entire commission and all the delegates who have participated. I can't tell you how exciting the discussion has been. Uh, we've gotten great comments, great feedback. Uh, but more than that, I think that we in the city are feeling the momentum grow. Uh, certainly as I travel around the city and indeed around uh, the nation, I also hear people uh, asking us about it. Uh, we saw the Washington Post put up a video describing uh, the situation that we face in Washington, D.C., and it was a video that got the most hits of anything that they've done. Uh, we've seen uh, national coverage of what we do. And yesterday, I had the opportunity to go on the Meet the Press Daily show, and, and when Chuck Todd was here, he said, oh, I was surprised by the feedback. I think of what is uh, critical right now now uh, that we have been discussing for the last couple of months is that we have a unique opportunity or not maybe perhaps not unique but a new opportunity uh, to gather all of our thoughts together get a new vote on statehood update our constitution and present a total package uh, to a new president and a new congress i was very uh, in the courage by the conversation we had last night because we had a future congressman from Maryland who knows the issue inside and out, back and forth. It's one thing uh, when we talk about it as Washingtonians, but it is hard to be a prophet in your own land, as they say. Uh, and to have uh, the future congressman uh, from Maryland uh, being an advocate, knowing the issues, and being willing to come and talk about them with us right now was so important. And he, too, thought uh, that we were at a critical point and the momentum is building and that it would make perfect sense uh, to have this package uh, uh, ready uh, on January 22nd when we have a, a when we have a you know what should I say a new president in town I was gonna say something else but I won't uh, and uh, I'm really excited about it so I want to thank everybody for the hard work and the many many hours that uh, people have put in to get us here a very uh, diverse um, smart group of people have come together to assist the, the commission and we're very thankful for their efforts but uh, I'm ready to get on with the third day at the convention and thanks for kicking things off thank you uh, I'd like to recognize our council member from Ward 2 Jack Evans thank you for being here Thank you very much, and good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning. Jeff. I know no one recognizes me out of my blue suit and my white suit. <laughs> <laughs> but it's uh, Saturday morning. It's errand day, right? And so I'm, I'm doing errands. But I uh, don't want to miss the opportunity to come by and uh, greet all of you. Uh, and first of all, thank our mayor, who uh, has really, really led the charge on statehood this time around and is doing a fabulous job, who's come up with a novel approach. So let's give Mayor Bowser another round of applause. Thank you, Mayor Bowser, for really, uh, for really leading this. And the rest of the members of the commission, our chairman, our senators and representatives who uh, have spent an enormous amount of time on this. Thank you all for, for all that you're doing. And my good friend, Beverly Perry. Where are you, Beverly? You gotta be here someplace. There she is, down here. <laughs> We go back 25 years together, and I know you've put in a yeoman's effort uh, on this. Uh, I can bring a little bit of a historic perspective to this. You know, I've been on the council now uh, 25 years, and as actually back in the 80s when we were doing this once before, um, was a uh, member of the Democratic State Committee and an ANC commissioner, so I was much involved in the efforts back then. And since then, in trying to find a time when uh, we could make statehood happen. Um, I, I wanna say this, the District of Columbia, and, and as I now chair the Board of Metro and travel around the region, meet with members of Congress about uh, that particular issue, we are a state. We act as a state in every aspect that Maryland, Virginia, and everybody else does. I mean, it's almost like, yes, it, and it's true, it's true. 
we are a state. We, we look like a duck, we quack like a duck. They just won't call us a duck. They call us a turkey for some reason. We're a duck, we're not a turkey. And, and, and I'm really serious about that. We, we issue driver's license. We do everything states do, we do. And we pay our own way. And, and maybe there is a difference this time than there was back in the 80s or in the early 90s. I, I remember having discussions uh, with members of Congress and the difference is we were struggling back then. Uh, our finances weren't in order, our government wasn't in order in many ways. Um, and, and so what they would say is get your house in order and come back when your house is in order. Well, I'll tell you folks, our house has never been in better order than it is today. It has never been in better order, never. Our finances are the strongest of any city, county, state in America. We have balanced our budget 19 straight years. We have $1.87 billion in our reserve funds. Uh, really, we have never been financially stronger as a city than we are today. Development, as you see across the city, is the envy of everyone across the country. Uh, the city government is working well. Our services are being delivered. And so for anybody to say to us, get your house in order and come back, we did that. We got our house in order and now we are coming back. And we deserve to be made a state immediately in January of this coming year. We really deserve it. So, <laughs> deserving, deserving something is not always synonymous with getting something, right? So, we have to have a plan, and this word goes back to what the mayor has put out there, this plan of having a convention, having a constitution, and be ready on day one, and we are going to elect Hillary Clinton, the next president of the United States. There's a doubt in my mind we're gonna do that. And, and I am a delegate for her. I know her well. When the mayor and myself and, and our congresswoman and Anita Bonds met with Hillary on 7th Street a week ago, right? It came up, yeah. the coffee shop had a sign right up there, <laughs> and really, she reinforced again her support for making the District of Columbia a state. And so when we capture the Senate and we have a president, the first thing she ought to do is put this out there. The first thing she ought to do is put it out there and get it done. And if, it's, if they don't know why it's in their best interest, the Democrats, it's because we will get two more Democratic senators. That's why it will matter. And we will get at least one, if not two, Democratic members of the House of Representatives. That's why it matters. And for us, we can get out from under these ridiculous congressional people who tell us what to do, right? right. Really, I tell you, when I... When I went up there, I'm diverging a little bit to talk about Metro, and I had to deal with those two idiots up there, Micah and Meadows. I gotta be honest with you. And then the third guy tried to compare our subway system, the second largest subway system in America, to the monorail at Disneyland. I mean, where do they get these people? Where do they get these people? You gotta wonder. Um, so any event, that's why it's so important that we get this done. And, and, Everyone's been saying it, I'm just going to repeat it. The window of opportunity is now. So let's pull together, pull together, get this done, get a constitution done, our finances in order. I can figure out how to pay for this thing. I can figure out how to pay for it. And there is no hurdle then that we cannot overcome to become the 51st state. There's no hurdle. And lastly, I want to recognize my good friend, Mark Plotkin. Mark has been with me on this journey since the early 1980s, really. And he's been there even before I have. And if there's anyone who has a fountain of knowledge and is more passionate about this issue, I don't know who it is, Mark. So thank you. He called me at 9 o'clock this morning and said, you got to get here. So here I am. <laughs> and I thank you for doing that. But again, thank you all. Thank let's, you. Uh, let's make this happen, OK? Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker will be Walter Smith, the executive director of Appleseed, and then so that they can begin to make their way to the stage, Keith Andrew Perry will follow him, executive director of the National Bar Association, and then we'll hear from Luis Torres. Uh, Mr. Smith. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Walter. So, um, as uh, Senator Strauss said a minute ago, this is about hearing from you all this morning, so I'm not gonna give another long speech um, what I want to do is just build for a moment on what you've already heard. 
um, and I want to start with what Carl Racine said. He quoted only part of uh, Senator Brown's favorite quote from Frederick Douglass. What Frederick Douglass said was, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. And that's why we're here today. What you all are part of today is a process, and thank you, Beverly Perry, for putting this process together. What you are part of is crafting our demand. And thanks to the mayor and others, we've thought through what this demand needs to look like. We're doing it the way another state did. We're showing that we've done all of our homework. We've got the Constitution. We've got the people behind us. We've got the boundaries. We've got a Republican form of government. And you all know what that means. I don't mean with a big R. And we're ready to endorse all of those things. And this is all to the good. But here's the point that I want to make. A demand without a plan to back it up to make sure it happens is not going to deliver. And the plan so far, the Tennessee plan, I believe is the right plan at the right moment for the reasons others have said. But here's my point to you today. Now is the time to be formulating the plan for the next step. As the mayor said last night, we have got to broaden the conversation beyond this room beyond the boundaries of the District of Columbia. If we're only talking to ourselves, we are not going to get this demand answered affirmatively in the Congress of the United States. And I believe, I believe, and I hope this is where our elected leaders come to, we're going to have to invest not just time, but money to make this happen. A well-orchestrated, well-planned effort countrywide to build the support that we need is going to take a lot of people and it's going to cost us money. But I believe if we invest that money, the payoff will be worth it. And all of us can be part of this undertaking, but we need people who know how to conduct a professionally run campaign. You know, there was talk last night, uh, Chuck Todd said we didn't have enough millennials in the room. <laughs> what makes this the moment for the opportunity is the communication tools that are now available to us. We have got to use them. You know, the, the best example that I know of recently where someone achieved the impossible was to change this country's viewpoint and the court's viewpoint and the Congress's viewpoint on gay marriage. People said that could not be done. A well-orchestrated national campaign changed the outlook on that issue. And it's even harder for us to do this because as many, many speakers have said, this country still does not know that the people who live in the capital of their great country do not have democracy. We have got to conduct a campaign to bring that to their attention. And when we do that, I am confident that we will get the support that we need, even if we have to pressure it. You know, Brian said she didn't want to be as polite as Carl had been. Um, I last night um, heard uh, Barney Frank said, politeness and patience are overrated. <laughs> <laughs> It is time to back this demand with a plan to deliver on it. Or as Justice Brandeis once said, most things worth doing were thought impossible before they were done. This can be done. And if we all work together, it will be done, I promise you. Mr. Keith Andrew Perry, the Executive Director of the National Bar Association. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, to the Commission and fellow citizens. Uh, I am, of course, uh, the Executive Director of the National Bar Association, but I'm spe speaking in my personal capacity. Uh, Carl referenced uh, the law 
as he, of course, uh, has every right to do as our first elected attorney general. And uh, in the law, personal testimony is always given great weight. And so uh, I will be giving personal testimony today. Uh, it's always good to see, I feel like I'm in a family reunion. I see so many old friends. Uh, on Tuesday, we were the last to vote for president of the United States. And after a fashion, that was quite fitting because so it, is, it has always been for us in the District of Columbia. Uh, we've been last in voting for president. My father was 51 years old before he was entitled to vote for president of the United States here in the District of Columbia. My mother, whose name in the French language was Etoile, meaning star, was 41. She was aptly named. She was gorgeous with a genius IQ and a servant's heart. She was a graduate of Cardoza High School, Minor Teachers College, and NYU. She was an adjunct professor at, U at uh, DC Teachers College. She proudly taught fifth and sixth grades in the DC public schools for nearly 30 years. And she retired on disability in 1980 as the director of the Head Start program. Her name was Etoile. She was a star, but she never had a, her full rights as a citizen. As fourth, as a fourth generation Washingtonian with uncles who came back from World War II with medals, and like so many of today's warriors, difficulty coping with civilian life, and with aunts and other relatives who took on the war at home with grace and optimism, even as they faced segregation in the schools and bigotry in the busy department stores that once anchored F Street. They all, proud native Washingtonians, stood for a principle that sustained them democracy. So in the spirit of my ancestors and of personal heroes like Martin Luther King and Julian Bond and Malcolm X and Adam Clayton Powell and Thurgood Marshall and Spotswood Robinson, Marion Barry and Muhammad Ali, this injustice, this disenfranchisement of 800,000 people will not stand. We are too comfortable in DC. Yes. We are too comfortable because the injustice that we face has not been placed in its proper framework. This country has gone to war many times, many times over this principle. When Iraq went into Kuwait and attempted to colonize that country, disenfranchising and marginalizing its residents when precisely the same thing has been done to the capital of this country, to us, that's a hypocrisy. Oh, they say, well, it's in the Constitution. They say that we are constitutionally not a state. Well, slavery was in the Constitution. So was the three-fifths compromise. So was the disenfranchisement of women. As Martin Luther King taught us with righteous eloquence, legally sanctioned injustice is no less an injustice. Yes, we are too comfortable here in DC, too comfortable. We, even as we sit here ensconced in what appears to be the uh, Jack, the construction capital of the world, even in this city, even after my 52 and a half years of residency in a city that I, quite frankly, often no longer recognize, the time has come to rise up against this anti-constitutional sublimation of the rights of American citizens and stand. Stand for justice. Stand for the equal rights inculcated in our Constitution. Stand for D.C. statehood now. You know, civil rights in this country is on a continuum. And as we fight in 2016 against the hate speech of Donald Trump, the George Wallace of 1964 comes to mind. But we overcame it in 1964, and we will defeat it now. We must remain vigilant, my friends. Hate speech takes many forms. Those who maintain that D.C. should suffer state-sponsored disenfranchisement because the Constitution says so are playing a cynical game designed to acculturate us to injustice. As one who studied constitutional law at Howard University under the great Herbert O. Reed, properly viewed, that's not constitutional construction. It's hate speech. So I implore all of us to stand up, be enraged by it, and act, 
even as we fight terror in this country and all around the world, we must stand up here in our city and fight for our own justice. And as I close, how can we best respond to the hypocrites in, uh, in ISIS and in, uh, in the Taliban and Al-Qaeda? Al uh, how can we best stand up to those hypocrisy than to eliminate those uh, that we see in our own country? To borrow from Frederick Douglass once again, uh, we must bring American citizens into the full light of Democratic Day, and that means D.C. statehood now. Who are we to sit on the sidelines in this fight? We need all of our talent, all of our brain power, all of our will, all of our love for our great city state. So I implore you to stand, stand, stand. <clears throat> and one day the 51st star, our own etoile, will be our own. Thank you. It's my privilege to welcome Luis Torres, Director of Policy and Legislation, League of United Latin American Citizens, better known as LULAC. LULAC. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Luis Torres, and I'm here representing the League of United Latin American Citizens, uh, or LULAC for short. We are the nation's oldest and largest Latino civil rights organization. And we were founded in 1929. Our mission is to advance the economic condition, educational attainment, political influence, housing, and civil rights of the Latino community. We have 135,000 members. And this fight to us is a part of our long journey, we think, for our members to get full and complete equality. Uh, and we are 100% behind the effort to achieve statehood for the District of Columbia. And we understand the battle because we're fighting a parallel battle in Puerto Rico, where we have millions of citizens there too who understand exactly what it means to be without a voice in Congress. Now, the interesting thing for us to see is that they tell our folks in Puerto Rico, you need to get your house in order. You haven't earned your right to be a state. And yes, Puerto Rico is going through some problems. But you turn around and you hear these same people make those same arguments to the District of Columbia. And yet the situation here is much different. And the point I want to make with that is that people aren't going to give us a seat at the table. We have to bring our own seat if we don't have a seat at the table. And it's not just enough that we sit there, we want to be there before they serve lunch. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so we're here with you. We are actually bringing about 20,000 of our members in July for our national convention in uh, D.C. Uh, we're very fortunate to have the mayor uh, who will be attending and our members are here. They are from across the country. You are not alone. We will support this fight to the very end. Thank you. Thank you. Is Kim Keenan here? Kim, there you are. And she'll be followed by Mr. Mark Plotkin. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It is really a great honor to be here um, and to get an opportunity to talk about this, this statehood issue that's so important to all of us. I want to thank the governor, I mean the mayor of the District of Columbia for this opportunity and of course our senior counsel, Beverly Perry. Um, I know my title is CEO of Multicultural Media Telecom and Internet Council, but I know I was invited here today because I'm a past president of the Washington Bar, the National Bar, and the District of Columbia Bar. So that there are jokes, you know, there I'd never met a bar association that I didn't want to be president of. But 
But the District of Columbia Bar Association comprises 103,000 lawyers, almost half of which live in the District of Columbia. I'm here because of the tradition of what lawyers mean to a process when there's a battle, when you're fighting and there's advocacy for people who, who need to have their voices amplified. I'm here because of the tradition of a lawyer named Charles Hamilton Houston who believed <laughs> that a lawyer is either a social engineer or a parasite on society. <laughs> And so there are so many lawyers in this audience, I know you know what I mean. Um, so it is a great honor, it is a great honor to stand here today and raise my voice for statehood. I came here as a teenager from Buffalo, New York, and I had never, yay, I had never seen a black bus driver where I come from. I, the thought of a black mayor, let alone a black female mayor, <laughs> was not even something maybe that my 17-year-old mind could have imagined. But yet, I came here to the District of Columbia where the then mayor, Marion Barry, created a program that provided my first job as a college student. I worked for S-Y-E-P, Y-E-S, and every version of the summer youth employment program that there was, and it began a greater love affair with this great city and what it means to the people of the District of Columbia. I've, been, I've done things in Southeast and Northwest and Southwest and Northwest, and I can't imagine living anywhere ever again. But yet, I took a job as General Counsel and Secretary of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. And there I was, traveling the country day in, day out, fighting for people to have the right to vote, fighting against a court system that had created a world where voting rights would be taken from people in a time when there was no problem with voting rights. There was no voter fraud. There were no people going to the polls and saying that they were Annie Mae Johnson or Ruby Jones, my grandmother's name. People who didn't have IDs and they were able to vote for a lifetime. But yet, after all those trips to Indiana and Mississippi and to Alabama, I'd come back to Washington and we didn't have representation in Congress. And so I dedicated a lot of my, my free time to working on voting rights because voting rights are the quintessential American right. When we go around the world and we tell people about how wonderful our democracy is, we talk about the right to vote. So what hypocrites we appear to be when citizens like the citizens of the District of Columbia are left to the experimentation of people in Congress who wouldn't be able to take those ideas back to their jurisdictions where they live. How dare they and how dare we let them? How dare we have a judiciary that has to be appointed by the president? How, why must we be left to the whims of another office, a politicized office, when we have the ability, we have some of the greatest lawyers in America in whatever jurisdictional boundary you can draw, and we have people who have, who have the ability to serve in the judiciary and make a tremendous difference. I'm here today because we all need to join together, regardless of what we do or where we live or what we work, and we must not be daunted by people who say that we haven't earned it or we don't deserve it. We are Americans. Of course we deserve it. The Constitution says we deserve it. And I, I hate these people who keep talking about what it said you know, so many hundred years ago, because if it said what it said and we believed that, then I couldn't even stand on this stage and we could not sit here today. We could not sit here today as an audience of people who represent all of what America is. That is what I am so proud of as I live in the District of Columbia, that we represent all of what America is, every color, every ethnicity, every, every rich cultural experience. That is what makes us special. And so I want to add to this theme of Frederick Douglass, and I know everybody said, I didn't, Carl, you beat me too. Power concedes nothing without a demand. And um, I know you jumped to it and said the part about it never did and it never will. But we missed the first part. 
<laughs> we missed the first part. I love the whole quote. Those who profess to favor freedom and yet deprecate agitation are people who want crops without plowing the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning, and they want an ocean without the roar of its many waters. The struggle may be a moral one, or it may be a physical one, or it may be both, but it is a struggle. And so I say to you, we don't have the luxury to listen to naysayers and people who would turn us around. We don't have the luxury to turn back because we are right. And not only will history prove us to be right, but everything that we believe in as Americans, one nation, under God, indivisible, with justice and freedom for all, everything that we hold near and dear says, that we must make this right. There are no triumphs without a trial, no testimony without a test, and there cannot be diamonds without fire. So if we want that star, we must not rest, we must not turn back, and we must never give up until statehood is ours. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bakken. After we hear from Mr. Plotkin, we will begin with the testimony from our delegates. Uh, this is my fourth appearance. Uh, obviously, I want to talk about the subject. Uh, it's the, she's telling me three minutes. I'm not going to stay to three minutes. I am going to thank Beverly Perry for asking me to speak. I know that wasn't maybe a popular decision. And <laughs> I'm going to thank the mayor. She's going to be surprised for having this because it has raised the visibility of the issue. Um, I see I don't have any titles. Uh, I'm just Mark Plotkin. And I know Washington, D.C. Uh, needs a uh, uh, titles to give you some standing. Uh, I am presently a contributor to the BBC on American politics. I write a column for The Hill every Friday. I would appreciate it if you would read it, thehill.com, and I'm a columnist for the Georgetowner. Uh, I'm here not with any professional affiliation because, first of all, I'm a citizen of America and, more importantly, a citizen of this city. I was a teacher in far southeast at Moton in the early 70s and far northeast at uh, River Terrace. I'm just not a talking head or some loudmouth on the radio. Uh, I was an elected member, Phil Mendelson, twice of the Democratic State Committee. I was a chairman of the Advisory Neighborhood Commission. So I just don't mouth off. I, although it might seem like that, I'm committed to this city and more importantly to the future of this city. And I want to be the skunk at the, din at the, at the dinner party. Um, no great American achievement has been without presidential leadership. And so please indulge me because I don't want this to be repeated. There's been an absence of presidential leadership. In 1992, Bill Clinton testified, excuse the history lesson, but I want you to be armed with facts. In 1992, Bill Clinton testified as a candidate. So did Paul Songus, so did Tom Harkin, so did, modestly, Doug Wilder before the House District Committee. And then when he was president, we did have a statehood vote. Let me remind you, it was 23 years ago. And the lobbyist, uh, for the White House left before the vote took place. And I said to him, where are you going? They haven't even voted. That shows the rhetorical commitment to statehood, but the not, as previous speakers have said, not the actual action commitment to it. We got 153 votes. The required number, talking with Fred Cook, is 218. Delegate Norton, for 23 years, has kept on talking about we got two-thirds of the vote and people start cheering. We lost. We didn't win. 
We lost. Let's stop defining defeat as victory. Let's stop taking credit for losing. This isn't horseshoes. Almost doesn't count. Then we had an African-American president elected in 2008, Barack Obama. Barack Obama, I asked him the first question when he was the uh, running. It was at a recreation center in Southeast. And I said, what's your personal commitment to D.C. statehood? And he said, elect more Democrats. I said, that's not my question. My question is, what is your personal commitment? And for seven and a half years, this president has ignored us, has taken us for granted, even though we voted 93 and 91 percent. He never lost one precinct in four elections. This has not been presidential leadership. When asked, he says, yeah, I'm for it. Michael Brown says he's for it. He's for it, Senator Brown, in the most casual, harmless way. He has not let us. He's got six months. I believe in redemption. He still has time to tell us he's for us, to speak to us in D.C. for D.C. He takes our votes. He doesn't mention us in seven and a half years. It takes him four years to put on the license plate. And when he's asked, Senator Brown, he says, yeah, I live here, so I guess I'm for it. That's not what I've heard here from these speeches. Why do I bring up presidential leadership? I was 17 or 18 years old, 17 years old, and I came to George Washington University, and I saw Lyndon Johnson, who has plenty of problems, but the Civil Rights Bill of 64 passed. I'll never forget him addressing a joint session of Congress and saying, we shall overcome. You don't pass legislation unless, unless there's presidential leadership. So I'm supposed to be a political analyst. Let me take a drink of water. <laughs> We're nearing completion, Hill, uh, Beverly. I know, three, three. We're, we, we, I'm filibustering. Um, the reason I moved up on this historic uh, journey is, Mayor, I don't want you to go to see one senator ever again like you did with uh, Senator Carper, who supposedly is a friend. You know, Mike Mansfield, the former majority leader, said, thank God for my enemies. Save me from my friends. <laughs> Tom Carper introduced the bill. It goes to his committee. You are not to go to see any senator. You got to make a nuisance of yourself, Carl Racine and every other elected official. And the first word out of your mouth has to be statehood. Nobody could say, well, she never brought it up. He, she never talked about it, or he never talked about it. If our delegate won't go to see these people, which she didn't in 2014, she told me to go see them, then other elected officials have to fill the void. I'm worried about Hillary Clinton, and I'm, I'm in closing. I'm worried about Hillary Clinton because I don't want her to do what Bill Clinton and Barack Obama have done to us. Talk a good game, but not do anything. And Madam Mayor, with all due respect, you know it's trouble when you all say, with all due respect. <laughs> you were there in Anacostia. You were at the Taxi Cab Commission. You saw Nera Tandon, I think that's the proper pronunciation of her name. She is the designated representative of Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign on the platform committee, she goes to the statehood constitution convention and she fails to mention the word statehood. I hounded her out the door and I said, is it going to be in the platform? And you know you're in trouble in Washington when they start walking fast to get away. She never committed. We are not to allow Hillary Clinton to talk a good game and not put it in the platform at the Democratic Convention in, Cle thank you for standing, in Cleveland, Ohio. And if, we, if it isn't the D.C. delegation, Shelley Tompkin and Jack Evans who left, you need to walk out. You need to do a Mississippi 64. You need to cause trouble. You need, you know, in the death of the salesman, they said attention must be paid. Attention must be paid. And I echo Jack Evans's remarks. 
The year is 2017. You got one year. You can't do it in 2018. That's an election year. Politicians are cowards. They don't want to. They don't want to vote for something like this in an election year. You got to do it in 2017. And I will, in closing, closing, <laughs> page, a page of Barack Obama. He. He, took, he got health insurance done without one, I, I hope there are Republican votes, but without one Republican vote in the House, without one Republican vote in the Senate. And you know what happened the next year. He couldn't have done it. 2017 is the year, and I close with this line. No senator, you run into him, should be safe at the Safeway. You go up to them and you tell them, you, you make a nuisance and you become a pest to them. No house member should be safe in a hardware store. You go up to them, you block their aisle, you don't let them to check out with making a nuisance of yourself. Thank you for allowing me to speak the fourth time. Thank you, Mr. Clarkson. We now come to the portion of our delegate testimony. Uh, our first delegate, uh, Mr. Roderick Woodson. <laughs> and, and I say this because we are at the point in the program where we will begin enforcing uh, the time limits. The fact that that follows Mr. Plotkin's remarks is purely coincidental, <laughs> but I would ask that you uh, Direct your attention to the timekeepers uh, from this point forward. Thank you for being here, Mr. Wilson. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. I, I find it interesting that I've been asked to testify to the commission, but I'm asked to face the camera. Face the camera. <laughs> face the camera, but the commission is here. Uh, but I see you. So, we see you. Um, uh, pardon me. Lift the mic. Yeah. Okay. Word to the wise. My name is Roderick Woodson. I came to Washington, D.C. to be a young law student in 1969. I have lived through every administration since Home Rule began and watched the emergence of Home Rule in the 70s. I listened to and observed and participated uh, in the statehood uh, engagement during the 80s and the early 90s. But I came away from that with a sense of cynicism about the issue. That uh, we were, as the previous speaker noted, we had been captured, I had been captured, by a sense of, re of resist not resistance, but a resolution to being a second class citizen. I'm a Philadelphian from Pennsylvania, from a family of people who were engaged civic, engage, civic participants. And it was incredible that uh, we did not have any participation on Capitol Hill. But today, I have been inspired by what has happened and what I've heard today by the leadership of Mayor Bowser and the commission to really push this matter forward. Um, so I join in others and saying now is the time. Mark is right, 2017 is the year. To the substantive um, issue of the day about um, the judiciary and these several different articles, I have just several comments. One, that it may be worthwhile for us to have an intermediate court of appeals to help our judiciary be more effective. Um, we just don't have enough capacity to engage judicial decision making. Secondly, our constitution ought to be specific about, our, about the district having the police power. Not, not, in, not a guess, but the police power is the, the foundation for regulatory and uh, governmental uh, action. That the power of the attorney general be more specific. Our Constitution, as drafted, doesn't say enough about it. Lastly, I want to just close by saying that the sin quanon of citizenship anywhere is the right to vote. We should not shirk from that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next delegate speaker, he may have a new title soon, but Robert White, if you would come up uh, and speak.
Following Mr. White will be uh, Lori Masters, Jack Dijon, Am I facing this way? Yep. Uh, good morning. Good morning. As the Democratic nominee for an at-large seat on the Council of the District of Columbia, I congratulate the mayor, uh, Mayor Bowser, our shadow delegation, and the uh, Statehood Commission for its renewed push to achieve equal rights for the nearly 800,000 residents who call the District of Columbia home. I fully support our ongoing efforts to achieve statehood for the District of Columbia and this approach to achieving it. Like every other jurisdiction in the 50 states of our great country, D.C. residents fight in wars, pay federal taxes, and rejoice in the triumphs and grieve in the tragedies of our nation. But unlike residents of those states, we have no say in charting our country's path because we lack the rights and privileges due to every American citizen, most especially voting representation in our federal government. We are a colony. While we fight for pieces of equality, like legislative and budget autonomy, there is little doubt that anything f short of full statehood will reflect the justice and freedoms that we claim as a country. As we work to draft a state constitution that the residents of the district will vote to approve and that we will transmit to the United States Congress in a petition for statehood, I urge my fellow residents and the commission to adopt a constitution in its most basic form in order to maximize our chances of passage. In detailing too many specific rights and privileges, we run a high risk of losing the support of residents who may disagree strongly with only a single provision or losing the support of members of a highly partisan Congress. Additionally, I strongly urge two specific inclusions. First, we must include a process for amending our Constitution similar to the majority of state constitutions. This will be a necessary element in an ever-evolving jurisdiction. Second, we must increase the size of our legislative body from its current size of 13. Two states in our country, Vermont and Wyoming, are represented by bicameral state legislatures of 180 and 90 members, respectively. While I propose no specific size, I note that a legislative body of 13 elected uh, members does not maximize government efficiency or adequately allow for the deep deliberation required of our legislature. Our legislative body should be large enough to allow for subcommittees that can deliberate the minute details of legislation and perform more effective oversight of our agencies and policies. I thank our elected uh, officials and our residents who have engaged in this process, and I plead with residents from across our city to join in and to engage more fully in the battles for local autonomy for our home, the District of Columbia. I look forward to working with the commission to achieve our rights as American citizens through full statehood. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Laurie Masters. Good morning, everyone. Laurie Masters. Um, I'm a partner at uh, law firm Perkins Coie here in the district, and I was uh, fortunate to uh, have the opportunity to run for Attorney General in the first uh, election in 2014 for our elected Attorney General. Um, so I wanted to uh, address a few points uh, specifically on the um, Constitution that has been proposed. First of all, thank you to the Mayor and to the Commission for all of uh, the terrific work that has been done on the Constitution. I think that it's been a terrific effort in building on what was done in 1992. Uh, 1982 and 1987, and that we should take advantage of that and move forward today, this year, to put this on the ballot and move forward with the effort for statehood. Specifically, um, I agree with Robert White that we should look at the um, size of the legislature. I think it's important, as um, Mr. White said, that um, we have a larger legislature so that we can ensure maximum uh, uh, ability to address the issues that are important to the citizens of the district and um, also um, it'll give an opportunity for more citizen engagement and more opportunities in the district for people to get the experience that we need here uh, and the more opportunities for people to run for elected office. Um, secondly, uh, on um, 
Article 1, Section 6, I, I would suggest that we give thought to the district being a leader on uh, the issue of uh, the drawing of legislative districts. Other jurisdictions have nonpartisan commissions that draw districts and take political uh, considerations out of the drawing of legislative districts, and I would suggest that we look at that. Uh, with regard to Article 3, the issue that we're here today, uh, ostensibly, uh, we're not limited to that, I think, but uh, specifically one of the issues that we're supposed to be addressing today is Article 3, the judiciary. Um, as Mr. Woodson said, I think that uh, we should consider um, intermediate appellate courts here in the district. If you talk to any of the judges on the D.C. Court of Appeals, they will tell you they have a huge caseload, they're overworked, we need more um, of a judicial capacity here to address the issues that come up through our courts. Um, I'd also like to say that it's important to keep, in my view, the structure that we currently have for appointing judges through the Judicial Nomination Commission. We have a very high quality judiciary here in the District of Columbia, and I would not want us uh, to lose that. Uh, and then, um, as a, to, to sign uh, off uh, in my last 30 seconds, I'd just like to say that, um, reiterate what Walter Smith said. We need a communication strategy to make this happen. We need, in the era of Citizens United, you may not like Citizens United, but let's take advantage of what's out there. We need that to be part of our communication strategy. We will not get what we need if people across this country don't understand that we don't have statehood and don't support us in our fight for statehood. Thank you. Thank you. Is Jack Nijin here. Dan Lewis, Jack uh, Nijin, nope, Nijin, Nijin? no, oh. it's not, <laughs> Sharona Morgan, Tia Smart, Cheryl Lou, Phil Thomas, Yeah, good. All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Tia Smart, and I'm actually from the state of Florida. I think, first off, we should give a round of applause for our state commissioners, um, and those, because there's very passionate members. Yes, a round of applause for all of them. They're all passionate members, and I've done so, so passionately. I've been fighting for the statehood for you all for years, and many without compensation. And it takes a lot of time and effort to get this movement for, work moving forward. So, again, I'm from the state of Florida, so this is all new to me. It's kind of eye-opening on knowing that there's no representation here and that your own federal government has done this injustice to you all. So I think for the first part, for the commission, it's really important to know that the residents need to get more in-depth knowledge, and there are grassroots efforts to do so. However, I think it's also important to know there are advocacy groups. So my suggestion is, is maybe put the leaders of the advocacy groups, like the committee chairs, and put their, maybe their emails on the website so community members can actually have access and um, I guess like reach out to those members if they want to get more involved into these advocacy groups. And then I know this has been taking a lot of time for the legis legislative branch. I think that's a really big issue for, for the di district residents. And I think it's important to note when you're trying to compare to Vermont and Wyoming, you guys, you surpass their population. So even in Vermont, they have about I think it's about 150 members, but in my own state we only have 120, so maybe kind of think about how you want to represent them, because in Vermont they have one representative for every 4,059 residents, so maybe instead of having the um, advisory neighborhood commissions kind of make them into representatives of your House of Delegates to have a more by care role and more representation in your new state. And then also the, a stronger Bill of Rights, that would be very um, efficient. I think from the 1982, just kind of take some of those portions of that into the new Bill of Rights to kind of make it more representative of what DC residents are, because this is gonna be a new state, you're gonna be making a presidents for the future. Also, when it comes to informing the rest of the country, from an outsider looking in, um, I think this injustice isn't just a DC problem, it's an American problem. How are we letting um, fellow, our fellow Americans go under this injustice? And I think it'd be easier to remind the American public that they should be angry with their own members of Congress because why are they so concerned with local DC affairs when they should be representing their own constituents that elect them? Right. So Thank that's you. the message. So that's the message that you should be sending to other Americans. 
And that is all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
And so I'm, I'm kicked out of the system. Uh, but what I wanted to say is that um, right now, a bill was just passed. NAMI National advocates heavily for more funds, more services for people with mental illness. I'm excluded from that process, not by NAMI, but by the District of Columbia not having statehood to allow me to reach my congressman or senator to say, pass this bill. So I am affected not only locally, I'm affected nationally because NAMI is a large organization, 50 states with over a million members who have voting rights in their states, who push for legislation to support and in veterans, children, and all who are suffering. Um, and so I have no major comments to make on the Constitution. I'm going to leave that to the lawyers, uh, who it seemed to be doing an excellent job on that, and since I just got a copy and have not thoroughly read it. But I will encourage us to broaden the base of public participation, to include and encourage all D.C. residents, those new to D.C., young and old, and those who have been here for a lifetime, like myself and my mother who passed at 104. For those who have been working on this for decades, it may seem like a slow process, but we are moving forward, and I encourage us to use and utilize new eyes, new vision, and new spirit to help us get this lying over the mountain and get us voting rights in the District of Columbia. I thank you. Thank you very much. Is Jim Slattery here. Thank you, Mr. Slattery. It'll be followed by Brian Love and Dale Brown. Good morning, everyone. Thank you to the commission members. My name is Jim Slattery. Uh, I am a Ward 4 resident, third generation Washingtonian. I'm descendant from uh, grandparents who called Swamp Poodle, now Noma, I kind of prefer Swamp Poodle, and uh, near Northeast. Um, I live, as I said, in Ward 4 with my husband of seven years, and I'm here on behalf of the mayor's uh, committee, uh, commission to the Office on LGBTQ Affairs to read a statement uh, on behalf of our chairperson, David Perez, who could not be with us. Basically, we weren't asked to look at the Constitution, but as active members of our uh, commission, we did take a look. And what struck us was who was left out of the Constitution. And by that, I'll just go ahead and read this. Um, language as currently drafted throughout the, do the draft Constitution does not reflect today's reality that all gender identities must be specified and respected. We believe that language matters, and that by saying men or women, or his or hers, versus people, or they or theirs, the commission, while not intending to do so, are reinforcing gender binaries and thus making people who do not fall into one of those categories, frankly, feel invisible. It is the, committee, the committee's desire to ensure all people of the District of Columbia, especially the LGBTQ community, not only feel included, but are included. And as such, we ask that each instance in the draft be amended to reflect this request. We feel as well that this action will only add to the common conception around the country that the district is a nationwide leader on all matters LGBTQ. Thank you uh, for taking the time to uh, listen to the advisory committee's request. Uh, we wholeheartedly support the renewed call for Statewood and hope that it will be a historic win on several fronts. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dale Brown. Uh, I'm sorry. Come. Brian Love. All right. But we, uh, before you begin, we do have these reserve feats for sort of our on-deck speakers. We want to keep this going. So as I call some other names up, Shelley Tompkins, you'll be next. Uh, Noah Wills. Go ahead. Thank you, members of the commission and fellow delegates to this convention. 
I have lived here in the district for several years now and was a supporter of DC statehood well before that. The provided draft constitution is an acceptable start, but there are a number of areas where we can do better. First, I do not like the name New Columbia. It seems clunky, it is derived from Christopher Columbus, who has a poor legacy, and the logical postal abbreviation, NC, has already been taken. I have heard several good names for our future state, any of which would be good choices. Potomac, Anacostia, Douglas, and, as suggested last night, the Douglas Commonwealth. All of these names are connected to our history, are distinctive, and do not conflict with existing postal abbreviations. Like others who have spoken before me, I think that all elections in the new state should be nonpartisan. This will allow federal employees to run for office, will reduce the chance of partisan gridlock, and will allow all citizens to have equal say in our elections, regardless of their national political affiliation. Along with this, I would suggest that we get rid of primaries entirely and go directly to the general election. To do this, I would propose that all elections use instant runoff voting or single transferable vote. This will prevent the situation that has regularly occurred in the past, where two candidates with a broad base of overlapping support split the vote in an election, resulting in a candidate with less overall support being declared the winner. For governor, speaker, attorney general, and other statewide offices, I propose using instant runoff voting. There are plenty of resources online describing the system in detail, but the end result is that this will lead to a winner who has the support of a majority of voters. For the House of Delegates, I recommend electing five delegates from each ward using single transferable vote, creating a significantly larger body. Again, specifics can be found online, but this system will result in a House that is far more representative of the diverse viewpoints of the district than our current system. Combined, instant runoff voting and single transferable voting will lead to much better, more democratic elections. While the Constitution mentions that elected officials will all have four-year terms, it does not say anything about the year that they will be elected. I think that all delegates should be elected in one cycle, and the governor, speaker, attorney general, and other non-delegate positions be elected two years later. This will allow sitting delegates to run for speaker or governor without losing their seat, which is a, privi which is a privilege enjoyed today by only half the DC Council. By electing all delegates at the same time, this opportunity is equalized, allowing any qualified candidate to run for these positions. There are several other changes I would make, but I, would save, I will save those for written testimony. As we continue this process, it is important to remember that our goal must be statehood. Whether we push forward with this current process or concentrate this year on building awareness and electing delegates to craft a constitution in 2017, we can't lose sight of that goal. We are Americans, and we deserve a vote in Congress. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> Dale Brown. Good morning. My name's Dale Brown. I'm in the Palisades area. I've lived there for a long time. I love DC. We really need statehood. I wanted to just talk strategy for a minute, going a little bit to the next step, the step at the end when Congress needs to pass this, and encourage all of us to start now to build an army of allies. We heard from someone from Florida who I believe is a simple example of the many people who eventually will help us but we need to get in contact with them. We need to talk to our relatives. We need to talk to our friends. Many of us come here with good, solid national networks, and we need to tell them our pain. We need to share our pain. We need to share the gain to them if statehood passes. So I just can't recommend enough talking to the people you know, telling them about this fight, starting now so when the time comes, we not only have advocates who are gonna sign a petition, write Congress, make a phone call, but start thinking about their state situation. Maybe they know somebody who actually gives money to this congressperson's campaign. Maybe they actually have a friend who they can talk to who will talk to the congressman. The problem is building these relationships needs to start now because frankly, asking them to support you politically or us politically actually, it's not an easy thing for everybody to do. Those of us who've done it for a long time often forget that. So that's my request to all of us here. Please start now to build the relationships with people in other states who are your friends, who are your relatives, and let them know that we do not have statehood, we do not have our rights, and we want it now. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next speaker will be Shelley Tompkin, and following her will be Noah Wills, Shirley Hoffman, Jesse Lovell, and Ann Hoffman. 
I'm uh, Shelley Tompkin, native Washingtonian. Um, as my good friend Mark Plotkin mentioned, I've just been elected as a Hillary Clinton delegate to the Democratic National Convention. And now I know that my good friend Mark Plotkin is going to be watching me, mm -hmm. as if I didn't know that before. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm continuing my testimony from uh, last night, and I'll try to be brief. Uh, I emphasize the importance of right-sizing the legislative body of government. And when I say right-sizing, uh, I believe it needs to be larger than 13 members, but needs to be right-sized. So I have two options just to uh, suggest to the commission that I think have already been suggested, but I wanted to add my voice to those options. First option would create a bicameral legislature by transforming the current uh, council into a state senate and would add a lower house of delegates comprised of four delegates per each ward. Each would be elected from different geographic sectors in the wards. The House of Delegates would therefore have 32 members with a population per legislator ratio of about 20,000 to one. It's not what you would find in most states, but it's certainly an improvement over 80,000 to one. It's also uh, politically, I think, and structurally an attractive plan in that it wouldn't upend the internal workings and structure of the current council. Essentially, the current council would be lifted and would become the state senate, and it, but it would allow the election of new representatives in a lower house that would be in a position to provide more direct representation to their constituents. Now, if you don't like that, there's some who say, well, you have a bicameral legislature makes policy making slower. Okay, so then we could, in fact, have a unicameral process, but increase the size of the current council threefold, adding two council members per ward, or ward, or at that time it would be district, two additional at-large members, um, which would bring the, count, the legislature to 30 members. Um, and in this case, the 24 delegates representing individual wards would each have a population per legislator ratio of about 28,000 to one. And I've seen this ratio recommended um, quite, now to finish up, um, I've got 30 seconds. I wanna say that I've seen, I've been to a number of these meetings. This, I think the issue that I've heard discussed the most frequently from the public uh, participation is this issue of representation in the legislature. So I appeal to the commission to take this seriously and uh, to try to edit and to amend the Constitution to this effect. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shelley. <laughs> Noah Wells. Hello, I'm Noah Wills. I am the current 2016-2017 president of AU Students for DC Statehood. Um, <laughs> and I also hope to be the last if all goes well. <laughs> um, I'm from Pennsylvania, but I'm also a registered uh, voter in the district for this election cycle, so I'm happy about that. Um, when I first read through this draft, I thought, okay, we've given ourselves legislative autonomy. Okay, we've given ourselves budget autonomy. But the thing that lacked for me was our history of the lack of voter representation in Congress wasn't explicitly mentioned in the Constitution. We need voter um, protections, we need voter qual qualifications explicitly mentioned in our Constitution. Um, for being a state created on these three principles, I would argue that voting rights is the most prominent, yet we do not mention it at all or a lot. Um, I recognize that we need bipartisan, non-controversial constitution to be presented to Congress to become a state. And I also recognize that we can amend the constitution in the future once we win statehood. But what is the point if we do not explicitly mention our need for free and inclusive suffrage in our founding document? It is my opinion that in today's politics, congressmen are not going to vote for or against the specifics of the constitution. They will vote against, for or against the idea of statehood. Don't let voting rights of the residents of New Columbia be established through amendments in our state constitution, much like our national constitution. I know that we allude to operating under the same voting laws and registration as under the district in Article 8, and I like DC's voter protections as it has allowed me to be a voter of the district. 
However, the last Constitution DC ratified, there was an entire article for voting rights. And in this Constitution, it is mentioned um, the last section of the last article as well as um, a section in Article 8. To conclude, I foresee New Columbia as the state with the most free and inclusive elections in the entire country to set an example for other states. I believe there must be an article on voting yet again, and I hope you do too. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Well, let me just say on behalf of uh, the commissioners that there's two AU alum up here for DC State, and we appreciate you. Uh, three. Are you three. Are you Four. Four. All right. So, <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yeah. What did you do? Right. All right. Um, um, I went to the uh, International School of Truck Driving. <laughs> Shirley Hoffman. Jesse Lovell. Oh, I'm sorry. Now here she is. Please come on down, Ms. Hoffman. I didn't see you there a minute ago. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. To Governor Bowser. You have to speak into the microphone. Oh, good morning. There you go. To Governor Bowser, Chairman, Mayor Bowser, <laughs> um, Chairman Mendeson, Senator Strauss, uh, Senator uh, Brown, and Representative Garcia. Um, I am Shirley Hoffman, a Ward 5 resident of the District of Columbia since 1962. I am also a graduate of the DC Neighborhood College, et cetera, and an advocate for all DC one through eight wards. Um, I am formerly from Virginia. In 1963, I was hired by Mr. Benjamin Bradley of Newsweek Magazine, and I worked there for 37 years. Um, what a historical moment for seeing civil rights and equal rights and now statehood rights. Um, my father paid poll taxes in Virginia in order to vote. You can hear the accent, Virginia, right? That's the foot of the Blue Ridge Mountains. Um, it was of the segregated era. Um, he was then told the people living in D.C., uh, his relatives all came home driving in nice cars with the tags and et cetera on it. And uh, of course, he did a lot of walking and he did his gardening, but he shared what he had. Um, but even at that time, he found out that um, uh, even though people came to D.C. and they went to other states, but D.C. had no representation. They paid so much taxes. They, they did everything in that order, but no representation. Even when home rule came in, people came home praising and bragging about the fact we got home rule. You know, we were wondering about home rule, but today we still are where we were 60 years ago when my father talked to me, and that was of the era of segregation, which I grew up in. I'm proud to be here in Washington, D.C. I'm proud to know our mayor and family and all who have made D.C. what it is and what it should be and will come to be with statehood coming into the process. Um, no more taxation without representation. We need statehood and we will all go to the polls in November. Thank you. Thank you. Jesse Lovell. Hi, thank you to the commission. Um, this is um, my second time testifying during the actual convention, um, although I've been here a few times. Um, I'm an 18-year resident myself of the district, um, originally from one of the two states with less population, originally from Vermont, um, where I, I do remember what it was like to have uh, some fairly progressive senators um, and, and representatives. But um, I'm also the secretary of the DC Statehood Coalition, and uh, I'm excited to see us move forward, um, but I, I think we, I do want to address some of the specifics and I uh, want, want to continue to make this as, as much of an internally democratic process as we can. So lo looking today at a lot of the, the specifics in Article 7, um, Article 7, 
section three, um, I'm going to talk about the, the amendments process. I, I do think we need an amendments process that can start with the public. Um, the current article now would really only allow amendments to start in the House of Delegates and then be ratified. Um, I do think we need, we need a process for, for this to start with the public as well. Um, and I think moving forward, certainly in future years, I think we should require a supermajority um, in order to avoid possibly initiating a cycle of just repeated changes over and over and over to the Constitution. I, I just think in general supermajorities are a good idea. As, as much as I might want to see some changes in, in the short term, I don't want to see constantly relitigating re everything in, in the Constitution. Um, but I think most importantly, I believe that democracy, um, maybe rather than the law, democracy advises that we hold a proper constitutional convention which would include elected citizen delegates who can participate in the drafting of this document. Um, I believe Article 7 should address the process of constitutional conventions for the future. Um, but even as we consider the particular language in this draft constitution, we should also consider how we are going to move forward in the meantime before DC achieves statehood and before we become full citizens, uh, complete citizens, um, in the words of Frederick Douglass. Um, we should continue this effort we began this year, all the time, these meetings, all of the advisory minds who've been, who've been going to work on this. I think we should continue the process past this year. I think we should work to improve what many are now calling an interim draft. Um, while we can vote on an interim draft in November, I really do feel we need to see some reassurance that this process won't end there. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anne Hoffman. She'll be followed by Betsy Cavendish, Cliff Smith, Jennifer Goodwin, and Keith Ivey. My name is Ann Hoffman. I've lived in DC for 24 years. I'm currently a resident of Ward 1. When I moved to DC from New Jersey in 1991, I did not realize I was giving up my United States citizenship. That realization came some years later when the internet became a big thing and I began getting notices about causes I believed in. The emails advised me to call my senators and tell them to support my position or to call my representative and ask him, it usually said him then, to vote for a particular bill. I suddenly realized that I had no senators and my representative had no vote. I volunteered in various ways to change our second class citizenship since the late 1990s. I'm very pleased that the mayor and the uh, statehood commission are taking steps now to secure statehood, which I realize is the only permanent, irrevocable, adequate way to make residents of DC whole, like the real citizens of the United States. I'm happy that we'll, we will be voting in November to become a state. I wish we were not voting then on this constitution. I think the process of democratically developing the constitution of our new state takes more time and more direct involvement of the residents of DC than will be allowed under the current timetable. Assuming that train has already left the station, however, I do have some suggestions for changes in the draft constitution. Here are just a few. If we are to include a Bill of Rights in the Constitution, I think it should be a proper Bill of Rights for us in the 21st century, not a repeat of the 1789 document. I think it should be written in clear, modern language going beyond just gender neutral pronouns. Substantively, I believe a proper Bill of Rights for DC should not include the Federal Second Amendment, which has in recent years been misconstrued by the US Supreme Court to grant individuals the right to bear arms. I believe I believe an appropriate constitution for DC should include an equal rights amendment barring discrimination based on sex or gender. 
although there is an equal protection clause in the draft DC Bill of Rights, that clause has not been held to bar all sex discrimination to the extent it bars race discrimination. I believe a new DC constitution should ban discrimination against GLBTQ people and people with disabilities. A new constitution should guarantee a right to counsel, not just in criminal cases, but in civil cases, which can result in loss of status and money. And I believe strongly our Bill of Rights should include the right to vote. Thank you. Thank you. And let me just also, if you have uh, prepared written comments, please feel free to uh, share them with the commission. We will make them part of the record. Ms. Cavendish. Thanks. Good morning, commissioners and neighbors. Thank you for holding this open and democratic process for hearing from DC residents about our hope for a new state government. I'm Betsy Cavendish, a proud Ward 4 resident and former resident of Wards 1, 3, and 6. I've lived in Washington on and off since 1981 when I came here for an internship and continuously since 1997 for all or part of about 30 years. I'd like to testify this morning in my individual capacity as a district resident on a couple of issues and may submit longer testimony on others. First, I like the name Douglas Commonwealth as I like the idea of keeping a DC postal code and the DC nickname. More importantly, I've been persuaded by many other speakers that honoring Frederick Douglass would be fitting for our aspirations as a state fully included in the United States democracy. As others have noted, Frederick Douglass was an abolitionist and a fighter for women's suffrage. His links to voting rights and full participation in our democracy for people who were enslaved and women who were disenfranchised make him a particularly appropriate person to honor as we strive to have votes in the Senate and the House of Representatives. Do you know who our neighboring states were named for? Probably not, but Virginia was named for the Virgin Queen, Elizabeth I, who, <laughs> who lived from 1533 to 1603, and Maryland was named for King Charles I's wife, Henrietta Maria. Uh, British monarchs. We need to pledge as part of this process for a Republican form of government, which means we won't have a hereditary monarchy. So why don't we name our state for someone who was part of our democracy and who was an American and who did live in DC. But no matter which name is chosen, I stand up for statehood and hope all of you will join in supporting statehood, even if you don't get every issue you want in our new constitution. Second, many commentators have focused on the small size of the legislature proposed in the first draft of the Constitution. I don't know how you all will ultimately decide on this question, but you haven't heard any views in defense of a smaller number of legislators, so I'll set, one, set forth one defense for the sake of argument. Critics of the small legislature contend that our, dis, uh, that our democracy is stunted because our council and the proposed House of Delegates only numbers 13 people. This, I think, is a thin view of democracy measured only by the ratio of representatives to population. Other than at the federal level, where we lack senators and a voting representative, we don't suffer for want of democracy here. We have a robust democracy with people participating in their government in myriad ways, directly and indirectly. In our robust democracy, the people are heard and the government responds. The council takes testimony and holds hearings on every bill, sometimes staying long into the night to hear all who wish to speak. Our city hall at the Wilson Building is accessible within an hour to every resident and is visited often by people who want to meet with their council members or to testify. The proximity of the legislature makes comparisons to the legislature people ratios in other states that are much vaster in size, uh, not opposite or not persuasive. We also have 40 uh, advisory neighborhood commissions with 296 slots for commissioners who meet, hear from their neighbors, pass resolutions, and weigh in on matters of zoning, alcohol and beverage licensing, planning, sanitation, recreation facilities, and more in their neighborhoods and throughout their city. We have 178 boards and commissions where thousands of fellow residents participate in government, helping to regulate industries, set standards, hear from regulated parties, review evidence, impose sanctions, make policy recommendations, advise agencies, and more. Access to our government comes in many other forms as well. 
Anyone can call 311 to get a pothole fixed or bulk trash pick up, picked up. Government quickly responds to individuals and on these and many other issues of local and personal concern. 311 essentially provides much of the constituent services that legislative offices also provide. Government agencies take comments on proposed rules, but often speak with interested parties and host roundtables before issuing regs. That is, citizen involvement in rulemaking goes well beyond what's required by administrative law. The mayor, too, and future governor, invites citizens to participate in the formulation of the budget, holds office hours where she hears citizen concerns, and walks through neighborhoods listening to people and their issues. Third and relatedly, unicameralism works well here. Having a unicameral legislature makes democracy more responsive. At the same time, our political culture guards the most vulnerable and minority rights. Ms. The Cavendish, I'm going to have to ask you okay. this. Okay. So we protect rights very robustly here, and I think whatever you decide, I hope everybody supports the Constitution and supports statehood. Thanks. Thank you very much. <laughs> Cliff Smith. Welcome back. I'll be a little more serious today. Um, my name is Cliff Smith. I've lived in D.C. for over 47 years. I first came here in 1951, living near Pennsylvania Avenue and Alabama Avenue. Um, as the years have gone on, I've gotten increasingly frustrated that I do not have real power as a voter to vote for somebody, to write to somebody who has real power in the Senate or in the House. And uh, it is not a matter of just that we pay taxes, that we, uh, that we join the military, et cetera. It is because we are American citizens, it's because we are human beings that we should have the equal rights in this country and in this city with everybody else in America. Um, this has been going on for 225 years since 1791. Regardless of everybody else getting rights, whether the Civil War and the 15th Amendment, with the suffrage and the 19th Amendment, all of this was irrelevant to D.C. We did not get those rights, neither men nor women, neither black nor white nor anybody to this day. Um, I've been, I went to University of Pennsylvania. There in 1960 was my first demonstration, uh, picketing Woolworths in support of the sit-in students in Greensboro, North Carolina. In 1972, I was with the first men's group in D.C. supporting the women's movement. That was the whole purpose of our men's group. I'm a life member of the NACP. Um, and I was in the State Department for 10 years. Uh, I was kicked out for being against the war in Vietnam. I was probably the only American diplomat in the world who subscribed to the Black Panther newspaper. Uh, I don't understand why State didn't want me to remain there, but you know, this, that's how it goes. Um, Recently, in the last two years, I've been very involved in going to demonstrations, eight or ten demonstrations of Black Lives Matter. I'm very involved with the WPFW, Pacifica Radio. I'm very involved with uh, Palestinian affairs because uh, my granddaughter is half Palestinian and uh, my uh, daughter used to live in Jerusalem, so we're very involved in that. Um, I have a very important point about the city council becoming the legislature. We have five at-large members of the city council. If you look back at history, back in the, when home rule came about, the very purpose of five at-large delegates was pushed by white congresspeople from the south to hopefully give a white majority to the city council of D.C., a majority African-American city. The logic was at that time, 40 years ago, 45 years ago, was that um, Whites vote in a higher percentage than African Americans do. So if you have at-large seats, you're going to have white representatives. And their logic was you have five at-large, plus Ward 3, always white, plus one other ward, and you get a majority of the city council. This was their logic. And at-large seats were used all through the South during the civil rights struggle by white racists in order to prevent African Americans from having their section of town or their section of the state represented uh, democratically. And I, do not think, and I do not think there is any legislature in America, any state legislature, that has at-large seats. And I do not think that we should have uh, over one-third of our future legislature to be at-large seats. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Jennifer Goodwin. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Jennifer Goodwin. I'm a native Washingtonian. Um, 
Living War 8. I just wanted to say um, I'm very proud to be here and also very proud that everyone here in D.C. is finally getting the statehood on the ballot in November. Also, um, for years that D.C. has been paying not only state taxes, but federal taxes, which don't make any sense. And I feel that D.C. is ready to be the next state. And I do agree with Mark Plotkin on all of his statements. That's why I stand up and clap like this. <laughs> So I just want to say, I just want for the panel to honor our Constitution, even if you have to rewrite and rewrite, rewrite, um, just to honor our Constitution and to fight for statehood and to let our Congress know that we are ready to be the next 51st state. We are ready. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Keith Ivey, he'll be followed by Charles Gaither and Paula Edwards. Hi, my name is Keith Ivey. Uh, I've uh, lived in DC for uh, 24 years and uh, I'm uh, active in uh, DC for Democracy and through it, uh, the uh, DC Statehood Coalition. I want to thank the commission uh, for bringing much needed new attention to statehood, reviving enthusiasm uh, about the issue, and, uh, and, and revisiting the Constitution, which is definitely time after a, a third of a century to do that. Uh, having said that, I have some other points to make that I fear make me another skunk at the party. Um, uh, the message we keep hearing is that we need to not worry about the details of the content or the process, but just get something, anything on the ballot and vote for it, no matter what it is, and maybe we can fix it later, despite the fact that currently any, anything to fix, you know, with, with, at least as it is now, the amendment process would be completely up to the 13-member the legislature. But the whole point of this is that we're supposed to be about creating greater democracy, not trading congressional overlords for a different undemocratic process. I don't know why, if statehood is a priority, this process wasn't begun last year to provide you know, some time for an actual consideration of a constitution. But in any case, this plan was put together at the last minute behind closed doors without input from people who have been working on this issue, in some cases for decades. And the process for creating this constitution falls far short of what the people of the district deserve. And it's essentially the Home Rule Charter with a few tweaks. And the Home Rule Charter is an act of Congress. And it adds insult to injury to refer to this event as a constitutional convention and to call us, say that all residents are delegates, what we're doing here is providing input, which is essential, and it's great that it's happening, but we're not writing a constitution here, and none of us as delegates have a vote at any point during the writing process. I can testify before the DC Council or email my council members, but that doesn't make me a member of the council. Um, in a very short time, we'll be presented with the final constitution that emerges from this rush process. In November, there will be no option but to vote yes or no, with the knowledge that a no vote will be interpreted as opposing statehood. I fully support having the people of DC express their support for statehood in a referendum in November. That's a great idea, but I have grave concerns about confusing and undermining the vote by combining it with the ratification of the particular constitution produced by this process. I asked the commission and the DC council to slow down, not on pushing for statehood, but on the constitution part and get the constitution right. We must have a real constitutional convention to produce a legitimate constitution. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mr. Gaither. Good morning and thank you for this opportunity and privilege. 
I was taught in this very building 30 years ago in Ms. Garcia's U.S. government class <laughs> that voting is a responsibility and it's a right. And it's one of the pillars of our government. I'm a member of the D.C. Democratic Party, a native Washingtonian, invested like all of the other residents in this auditorium. I would like to thank the mayor for her continued leadership and request that all citizens continue to support her by placing this matter on the ballot in November so that it will be on the president's desk in January for her to sign it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We hear from Paula Edwards. She'll be followed by Laura Fuchs, Mass Gila, Dale Duchette, and John Healy. Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak. Um, I'm a native Washingtonian, born in the old Columbia Hospital for Women. And <laughs> see, there's some others here. Um, I've enumerated my differences with the process and with the Constitution in my written testimony. They are very numerous. But I'd like to speak why it's so important for us to support this process. Four days ago, there was a decision in a case called Puerto Rico versus um, Franklin, California Free Trust. I've got that right. Yep. Franklin, California Tax Free Trust. If that doesn't alert us to the dangers of our nebulous status as a quasi-state, nothing else will. Hedge fund managers were able to take advantage of Puerto Rico's exemption from the same rights that are available to every other state in this country to declare bankruptcy and to force Puerto Rico into a state where they cannot take advantage of the um, bankruptcy that, they, that any other state could declare. And Sonia Sotomayor tried to argue the case. She did a brilliant job, but she failed, unfortunately. DC is the only jurisdiction in this country that pays both federal and local taxes and that does not have ultimate control over its local taxes and has no input into the distribution and use of its federal taxes. This includes Puerto Rico, Guam, Virgin Islands. We're one of the only jurisdictions in the world that is in this situation. The only others I know of are um, occupied by military forces. I go to international tax conferences. I go to, um, these are people by people who are legislators. They are tax experts. They are amazed when I tell them of our status. They are unaware of it. And if nothing else comes out of this process, we have to make everyone aware of the unique position we're in. It is very unique, and it's dangerous, and it can't continue to go on. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Ms. Fuchs. Good morning. I'm Maskila, a long-term D.C. resident, uh, and I hope that you've heard this before. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, this is not a statehood constitutional convention. I echo, echo the man who just spoke uh, before me. Uh, this was a well-kept secret. This should have been broadcast all over the city, to the schools, elementary, second grade, someone mentioned, middle school, high school. It should have been a hearing in each ward uh, notice given to other cities, uh, states, and countries, because this is so-called the capital of the world. Okay, right? Uh, this school is very far from Ward 8, besides the woman who just spoke. Who else is from Ward 8? Anybody else? One, two, three. Okay. Um, if it, in this age of government uh, secrets, this should have been exactly the opposite. The beginning of a new age in America and Washington, D.C.'s Statehood Constitutional Convention could have started it. As you can see, I am here to protest what is happening. And I hope there is a no vote to grant D.C. statehood in November until it is done right. I hope that other citizens will say the same thing. Thank you. Ms. Fuchs. Uh, hello, my name is Laura Fuchs, and I just finished my ninth year teaching AP government and DC history in DC public schools. 
I'm 100% behind the need for statehood, but I'm unwilling to enshrine the Home Rule Act and an overly powerful executive in order to achieve it. In advanced placement government, we talk a lot about the importance of checks and balances when analyzing the U.S. Constitution. There are some basic principles at play, but one of the main ones is the need to hold our executive branch accountable to the citizens. In the current draft, Article 2, Section 7, Part B, Clause 2, states that the House of Delegates may establish which education policies can go to the school board. It then continues, saying provided such policies shall not include policies that were not approved immediately prior to the effective date. This is an undue limit on our city council, and it enshrines mayoral control. As an employee under three separate mayors, under mayoral control of the school system, I have learned firsthand the problems that arise when the system of checks and balances completely breaks down and is non-existent. I'm not going to go into them now, but to, combine these, to combat these problems, we can learn from our national government. Number one, appointments of heads of major agencies should be approved by the council, or future upper chamber, after extensive hearings. Number two, all acts must originate from the House of Delegate members. Number three, we should have a lieutenant governor. Number four, the election of the attorney general should be separate from the governor to encourage more competition and opportunities for cooperation. Number five, we need a larger legislative branch so that there are more opportunities to hold the executive branch accountable. It does not make sense to me that we fight for a voice in Congress only to deny it here at home. We do not want to create a local government that is a centralized government. We need a controlled executive branch. Statehood is fundamental, but constitutions are important. We are not asking for perfection. We are asking not to be the least democratic state in the United States of America. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dale Doucette. John Healy. Good morning. My name is John Healy. I'm a 28-year resident of Ward 3. I'm here today representing DC 2020, which is a grassroots citywide coalition of disruptor, disruptors who have a clear vision for the future of DC. We'll be submitting more extensive comments online. However, verbally, we want to highlight three flags regarding the draft constitution. The first involves the Attorney General. DC voters have previously spoken. We want a standalone elected Attorney General with clear authority and powers. Currently, the draft takes us backwards. It puts the AG back under the oversight of the governor. It does not delineate and, uh, any of the AG's authority, duties, and autonomy. You need to fix this portion of the draft to move the AG out from the control of the governor and to delineate their duties and authority. The second flag regards ethics and integrity of the legislature. Currently, the draft allows legislators to have outside jobs and only requires the governor and the speaker to exclusively work for the voters. Uh, this ban of outside employment needs to be expanded to cover all legislators. The need is highlighted by a current council member who is a paid lobbyist of his fellow council members on behalf of the clients of Manit Phelps. This doesn't pass the smell test. Close this loophole. The third flag it regards ANCs. As evidenced by all of the ANCs who testified at Anita Bond's recent hearings on the great weight provisions, ANCs consistently gave testimony that they aren't given great weight and often feel totally ignored by DC government agencies. Plus, all the ongoing press coverage of the infighting, manipulation, and personal agendas within the ANCs uh, and the failure to, for them to fulfill their sacred oaths that requires them to do what's best for DC instead of their personal agendas. ANC should be eliminated from the draft rather than perpetuating this failed concept and instead replace them with an elected representative to the DC House while keeping the current council as the DC Senate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bill Hersey. <laughs> Bill Hersey. Next up following that will be Deborah Shure, Sharona Morgan, and Johnny Rice. My name is Dale Doucette. Nope. I am uh, 58 years in Washington, D.C. I came here uh, also to work for John Kennedy 
and I'm part of a crew that he called uh, the best and the brightest of the young people. And I stayed to keep working in DC on our cultural revolution. So what I would like to propose, I, we have this word, new Columbia. I don't like it. We're not new. Let me tell you, this has been called Columbia because we're named after Christopher Columbus. And we were the Columbia Territory before we were a Columbia District. Columbia is the term that oversees for the 1700s, 1800s, it represented the United States. And so I think that the state of Columbia would be adequate. It's short. We're not new. We've been the same thing since the beginning. We're just better at it. So my proposal is that we should be state of Columbia. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Bill Hersey, followed by Deborah Shore, Sharona Morgan, and Johnny Rice. Good morning. Thanks for the opportunity to testify. Um, I've heard um, several people <clears throat> mention the fact that we're going to need widespread support across the country in order to get statehood passed. Um, I was one of those people <clears throat> in the widespread country back in 1972 when I first learned of the statehood movement when I met Julius Hobson at the People's Party Convention in St. Louis, a Democratic Socialist Party, by the way. Uh, <clears throat> uh, he was running with uh, Dr. Benjamin Spock on the People's Party ticket. Bernie Sanders was also active in that campaign, and Bernie Sanders remains committed to statehood. And I, I want to address comments to the superdelegates who are here <clears throat> and also the elected delegates. Uh, support Bernie's move to put progressive issues on the platform, including statehood. Bernie will be with you on that. That's very important. Uh, he will come out for, for Hillary and, 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 and put his uh, majority of the under 45 voters that he has activated amazingly uh, to, to bring them into the political process. Uh, he is not against Hillary um, when, it, when, the, when, the, when the chips are down. So support his progressive uh, uh, moves to get the uh, uh, campaign platform going in the right direction. Um, I was involved in state party uh, uh, reform back in Missouri uh, to, to get the proportional representation in place, uh, which is now de rigueur. Uh, in party operations. It wasn't back in 1972, 68, 72. It wasn't like that. Um, I also have a, uh, <clears throat> a comment on a, a, an environmental issue, um, namely in Section 6, uh, or, uh, Article 6, Section 2, requiring 5% um, of each, uh, or at least five of the uh, wards to get an initiative on the ballot seems a bit. Uh, uh, cumbersome and overly uh, restrictive. Five percent of the registered voters ought to be all that's necessary. I raise this issue because uh, I'm interested in, in environmental issues. I was a senior scientist at EPA headquarters for 27 years and involved in a lot of this kind of stuff. I'm currently involved uh, working with uh, LULAC, among others, to get fluoride out of the drinking water in the district. We had a big problem with lead in the drinking water here uh, that came to, it came to light in, 19, or in uh, 2007. It's directly related to the chemical we put in the water to, to put fluoride in the water, fluorosilicic acid. When that stuff is put in the drinking water, especially in connection with chloramine, which is what we use as a chlorinating agent, it leaches lead like gangbusters out of plumbing fixtures and out of lead service lines. Uh, there's a recent article in the Post the uh, day before yesterday, I think, again, by Brady Dennis, mentioning that like one in seven cities uh, uh, in across the country have problems now with lead in the drinking water, and it's because most places that put fluoride in the drinking water use this fluosilicic acid, and it's causing increased blood lead levels in kids. This is in the peer-reviewed literature. 
So anyway, again, uh, th th thank, thank you. you. And I also want to put in a, a, a pitch for the bicameral, bicameral legislature uh, with, say, four representatives from each, from each ward to be in the House of Delegates and then the Senate. Thanks. Thank you very much. Ms. Shore. Never sure. Followed by Sharona Morgan, Johnny Rice. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today, particularly to the mayor, the state commissioners, our shadow delegates, um, and the city council. I'm Debbie Shore. I'm a resident of Ward 3 and an activist in the city for the past 45 years. I have heard others um, yesterday and today speak so eloquently about how important it is for us to have statehood. I am very impressed by the number of the, the range of people who have testified, millennials, recent voters, people who have been, been here for generations. So I don't need to underscore all of the great reasons why we need to have statehood. Um, but I do want to say, bring one thing into that I haven't heard which is I am the founder and executive director of Sasha Bruce Youth Work, and we work with runaway and homeless youth and young people and families in the city that are really having a hard time. And what we do with them is to try to help them to see that they have some agency in their lives. And when we have young people who, we have a, a place where we have had recent conversations with young girls who are having a lot of trouble in their lives, and they can look at the Capitol building, the dome, and they are, feel as far away from that reality as if they lived in Alaska or somewhere else. We need to recognize that we need statehood for all of us who have a sense of agency in our own lives and particularly for people who don't feel that. So I believe that this is a wonderful opportunity to enthusiastically embrace, show the world and the Congress that the city is ready and wants statehood and to that end, I am committed to work to educate others, to get the referendum on the ballot, and to have an overwhelming number of voters to ask for statehood. That's the first step. And I say this as a citizen, but also I am the chair of the Ward 3 Democrats and a member of the DC State Committee. So I don't speak for any of those groups here, but I have um, arranged a special meeting of our Ward 3 delegates in about 10 days to assure that our neighbors and delegates and everyone is aware of the Constitution, the referendum, and what is at stake so that we can increase the number of ambassadors for that effort. We need as many of them as possible. On the Constitution itself, my main point of substance is that I believe strongly that the number of legislators must be increased. I really appreciated what was said by others who have looked into this carefully. Um, the, the idea of a bicameral legislation, legislature, um, it would be wonderful. Certainly, um, if we have a unicameral legislature, we should certainly have at least 30 people. I like that, that, um, that, that construct. Um, this would mean, as I, uh, calculated it that we would each ward representative would represent 22,000 people that's a lot of people already so in addition to the fairness factor of increasing the number of legislatures the reality for our city is that there have been limited opportunities for elected representation and we should take this opportunity to enhance the chance of building leadership thank you I want to say also that the Ward 3 Democrats took a survey about a year ago about what was important in the city, education, ethics, housing and homelessness, environment, and statehood. We need to make sure that that kind of message get, moves forward, not just within our city, but that we do, as many people have suggested here, that we make sure that the world knows that too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Jonah Morgan, followed by Johnny Rice. Good evening. I sincerely thank Mayor Bowser and the New Columbia Statehood Commission for allowing residents to testify on this important issue. My name is Sharona D. Morgan, 
and I am a fifth generation Washingtonian and a strong and continued supporter of DC statehood. Having witnessed the trials and tribulations of the district, not having national representation to fight for our programs, policies, and budget that impacts our residents and city, it is essential that the district get the statehood it deserves now. Yes, the district has made progress since home rule in 1973, but we are not done fighting. We too deserve the right to have a governor and true congressional representation. Congresswoman Norton has and continues to fight for the district, but we need to have a targeted effort in the Senate and through a governor to ensure we are heard and truly represented on the national level. We need change, and I am confident, similar to you, that the time is now and our city is hungry for it. Our city and country is in turmoil. From last week's tragedies in Orlando to our daily violent crimes, it is clear proper national gun balance legislation is partially the cause of this horror and would help to curtail more crime than death from guns. There, there is too much at stake on the national and local level, and the district's voice needs to be heard. So please, continue the charge. Remember the time is now, not later, but now. I look forward to voting for statehood soon. Thank you very much. And again, please feel free to leave your written comments with us as well. Johnny Rice will be followed by Anise Jenkins and G. Lee Aiken. Thanks. I'm a short person. Good afternoon, I'm Johnny Scott Rice. I'm a fourth generation Washingtonian. In the house that I grew, grew up in, in Northeast, that we still own, there are seven generations that have come out of that house. I am one of the people that traveled around the country with Senator Brown, with Jean Kendo, Mayor Gray, and others. I have never experienced the dissatisfaction of giving us statehood personally the way I did in the state of New Hampshire. They talk to us as if we were not human beings. They talk to us as if people didn't actually live in the city. One man said to me, are you sure you live in DC? I said, yes. He said, I did not know that people actually lived in DC. And I said, what do you think it means when people say they're generational? Well, I happen to be one of those generational people. I happen to be one of those people that went out in the states and literally begged for them to support statehood. I think that we should do more. I think that we should send more people out. Even though your feelings will get hurt, you will be talked to like you weren't worth a damn that your taxes don't mean anything, and that you don't have a resident. I believe that if we continue to fight and we send people out with strong voices, because when I spoke to that council in New Hampshire, my ignorant butt did not realize that these people were packing guns. Live free and die, that's what they mean. Live free and die. When I'm talking, this man, put his jacket back to let me see the butt of his gun. My ignorant butt <laughs> thought it was his palm pilot. <laughs> I don't know what a gun looks like, okay? The lady sitting next to me, when I sat down, she said, baby, you spoke well, but let me show you something. She opened her purse. It was a gun in her purse. I looked at her, I said, why do you need a gun? She said, this is to live free and die. I said, what the hell does live free and die mean? She said, we have the right to shoot you. You went in the building, their government office, their council office, there are no security guards. There's a sign that tells you where to go for your hearing. The maid is coming through the building, clean the building, stacked with a gun and bag, trash bags. This is what happened in the state of New Hampshire, okay? Y'all think New Hampshire like us? No, they don't. Y'all think these states want us to have statehood? No, they don't. But we want it, and we're going to continue to fight for it. We have a mayor who's willing to fight. We have a city council that's willing to fight. We have to be the citizens 
that's willing to fight. I hear all you people talking about how many years you've been here. Well, guess what? I'm 75 years, four generations. Okay? So understand that it is a serious issue. It needs to be taken care of, and it needs to be taken care of now. I don't have a written statement because I was out of town. I got a call while I was out of town yesterday to come and speak here today. I was supposed to be out of town today. I canceled my sister's memorial service to be here with you all this morning. So understand, I'm going to continue to fight. And I'm going to ask the mayor and the council chairman. Phil was there. He knows I'm telling the truth. Graham was there. He knows I'm telling When we got on the shuttle to go back to the airport, we were all down. We were so down because we had been so disrespected. I will never step foot in the state of New Hampshire again as long as I live. They have nothing that I want to come to see. Nothing. Thank you, Mr. You Wright. talk about Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders ain't done nothing for us. Right. He couldn't come to that hearing in New Hampshire, and he lives there. He didn't. He knew we were coming. Okay, Miss. So Grace. I will tell you, we need to get it done. We need to get behind our members. We need to get behind Eleanor Holmes, and y'all people that want to live here and claim D.C. as your home. Fight harder. Thank, Thank you, you, Ms. Rice. Thank you, Ms. Rice. You know, excuse me, Senator. Can I just add that I was there with Johnny, and I've never been prouder of a constituent than I was of her. She stood up to those people in New Hampshire, and I'll never forget it. And I'll tell you what, they'll never forget it either. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. We'll hear from Anise Jenkins, followed by G. Lee Aiken, and then Bill Lightfoot. Hello, everybody. Thank you for being here. Thank you for caring. Thank you for not doing your errands. And thank you for, not, for getting that babysitter so you can be here. Thank you for getting people to watch your grandchildren, whoever you are. Thank you. We are the troops for this fight. We are the people who are going to go around the country. We're the people who are going to educate our own community about why we need D.C. statehood. I'm Anise Jenkins, Executive Director of Stand Up for Democracy in D.C., otherwise known as Free D.C. We are a continuation of the Free D.C. movement that came out of Mississippi with Dr. James Foreman of SNCC and Marion Berry of SNCC. We were told by one of our elders in our organization who helped to found it that you are not starting this movement. You are a continuation of a movement that has been going on for over 200 years. It is up to us to keep the fight going. My Ia Yabo, Royal Height, Harold Hunter, Chuck Hicks, Sherry Flack, Susan Woodard, and grandchildren, Sandra Mor Morgan, uh, Tabu Taylor, Ivana, Powell, Joyce Robinson, Paul, uh, Ma uh, Malcolm Wiseman, Karen, I'm going to put your name in it, Karen Shulgit. These are all people I'm going to, and OB sitting right there in that red ambassador shirt. These are all people who are going to continue to be ambassadors for D.C. statehood. I want to get back to something that I started some time ago as far as a criticism, and I want to say that the commission has improved. The word did not get out in time. The people that I named knew because they are part of an organization, but the word did not get out in time to the community. If we are a convention, all the seats should be filled. What we want to do is get the word out. We want to tell our neighbors. We want to get to the schools, get to the churches, get to the unions. You made a great effort by making the posters and the flyers. I want to compliment you on that. However, at this point, I still suggest because people do not know a constitution. I don't believe in people voting and approving for something that they don't know what it is. I am going to suggest again that you take the Constitution off the referendum. I want people to approve statehood. We don't ever, ever want to vote against our freedom and our liberation. But I would, I would really suggest, and I'm going to stop, 
is that that be removed until people have been educated about the contents and that they can say significantly and in reality that they support the Constitution as it is presented to them. Thank you and free DC! Free DC. Thank you, Ms. Jenkins. Stay hood now! Next witness is G. Lee Aiken, will be followed by Bill Lightfoot and then Sheila Reed. It's okay, don't have to raise it. Yeah. Uh, thank you, I want to thank again the uh, people who have put this together, all their staff, and all of you for being here and taking part, even though you are not elected delegates. And it doesn't really matter what you're saying, I'm afraid, because we will be voted on by a council which already has three lame duck members, which is one reason why the Constitution, as currently presented, should not be voted on in November. We should absolutely vote for statehood, but we should have the new council being voted once we have voted for how the Constitution should appear. Uh, I would like to introduce myself also. I'm G. Lee Aiken. Uh, like Robert White, I was elected in the primary to be the ballot candidate in November with the D.C. Statehood Green Party. Now, the, the, the national affiliate Green Party has had statehood on its platform for many years. And not only should we send a people to the... Uh, Republican, the Democrat conventions, we also ought to have somebody going to thank the statehood uh, convention for having us on their platform all these years. So uh, that's all I'm gonna say on that. I'm very happy to be here in Wilson High School. <coughs> I came here to DC the day after Kennedy was elected. My children are born here. My children went to this high school and my son graduated from here and then almost immediately ended up fighting in Gulf War I, plus two tours in Afghanistan. And we have had 6,000 of our citizens killed working for the national government, for all the people, and we still don't vote. Uh, we need to look at what we have ahead of us. And I had prepared on my blog, gleeaken.blogspot.com, a complete calendar of what's going on, which I try to update regularly. And in the future, once this is over, um, the council will be looking at what the mayor submits for approval for statehood. And it doesn't say anything about it being a hearing. I really think we should have a voice on that as well. And as I said, with three members being lame ducks, they should not be approving the Constitution, only the referendum to have us approve statehood, which I hope we will do un unanimously. Uh, subsequent to that, uh, the Board of Elections will submit language to, oh wait, the Board of Elections will hold hearings to certify the referendum language. And we should try to attend that hearing, and I don't know whether we'll have input for that, but we certainly should try to have it there too. And then assuming publication on 812, possibly, there will be 10-day window opens for objections and requests for hearing. So these are all continuing steps that we should be paying attention to and taking part in. Thank you very much for your hard work and coming here and sitting on these hard seats. Thank you, Ms. Egan. <laughs> <coughs> Mr. Lightfoot. Thank you, good morning. good morning. I'm going to speak this morning as a former member of the Council of the District of Columbia, as well as a former chairperson of the Council Judiciary Committee. I'm going to specifically address Article 3, which relates to the judicial branch. Let me first commend the mayor and chairperson Mendelson and the other members of the council with making this effort now to bring statehood to the District of Columbia. I think the strategy being adopted is very important and I think it is very important we do vote in November so we can move this forward to Congress and force this issue. But now let me address, address the substance of Article 3 if I may. I'm going to specifically address the um, absence of the Tenure Commission, which I currently serve on. I am an appointee of the mayor to the D.C. Tenure Commission. We have two commissions in the District of Columbia that deal with the judiciary. One is the nominating commission. The other is the Tenure Commission. The Tenure Commission deals with disciplining judges and reappointing judges. When we discipline judges, we in large part follow the code of judicial responsibility. 
Uh, that is not mentioned in here as one of the criteria to be considered when a judge is to be removed or reappointed. So I would urge the people on the dais and others involved to please include, number one, the Tenure Commission as well as the Nominating Commission. The jobs are very much different. Secondly, I would ask the um, framers of the Constitution to also include that one of the measurements by whether a judge should be reappointed or disciplined or removed from the, from the bench is the code of judicial conduct. That has been developed all across the country, used in all of the states, used by all of the um, agencies with responsibility for the ethics of judges. There are court cases which have interpreted. We've got certain precedent we can follow. There are rules and standards which are very clear. So with that, I will end by saying, again, I commend you by taking this action now. I think it is important that we vote in November, and I know this will be somewhat controversial, but the argument not to vote in November, to me, is similar to what I hear in Congress when they say they're not going to vote on President, Ob President Obama's nominee to the Supreme Court. So with that, I thank you very much and appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sheila Reed. She'll be followed by Janet Brown, Eleanor Hart, John Pincus. Good afternoon, everyone. I am speaking today wearing two hats. I am director of the Mayor's Office of LGBTQ Affairs. I'm also a longtime Ward 4 resident. Um, I started out this past week at the White House with President Obama celebrating Pride Month, where he referenced Bayard Rustin and called us a room full of angelic troublemakers, celebrating the progress that we've made. And I ended the week mourning with my community over the Orlando shootings and the tragedy and the aftermath of that. I've attended no less than five or six vigils and candlelight workshops. So when people ask at these workshops, what can we do? What can we do? We feel for the community. These are a lot of allies, not just the LGBT community. What can we do? I say this. You can vote for statehood in D.C. You can keep guns out of D.C. Right. You can take control of your future. You can make sure that we have senators and a, and a congressman with a vote. And I connect the dots for them to say, we have nobody that can protect us. So we must take a stand and ultimately learn to protect ourselves from guns. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Janet Brown, followed by Eleanor Hart and John Pincus. Okay, but if you'd all come down and make your way so that we could uh, keep things moving, Deborah Prindle will be after that. everybody. Um, good morning. I guess it's still morning. Um, my name is Eleanor Hart. I live in Ward 1 and I have been working for statehood for about five or six years and I've been very active in the DC statehood coalition. Um, bef I would like to thank the mayor and her team for the statehood initiative um, and I also want to thank the uh, drafters of the Constitution. I think they did a good job in getting and putting together a document that will be approved by our 13 member council, which has to happen. And it, I think it will, it has fewer reasons for the members of Congress to object. I think as few reasons as possible. Before I um, address the Constitution, Explicitly, I do want to mention someone's name. I understand his name has not been mentioned at all during this convention, and I think we should uh, think about the person who made statehood a real issue in D.C., and that was a man named Ed Guinan. He was the person who led the statehood initiative to get it on the ballot. And you can, he has a, the post did a wonderful obit on him, so you can Google him to find out more about it. But I think we should remember Ed Guinan as we think about statehood. Um, 
the Constitution has one very serious flaw to me, and that is an absence of a really vigorous amendment process. You know, this is a document, as we know, that was written by Congress, and um, it's a kind of, we're going to take it or leave it, and I'm willing to take it uh, if there's an opportunity to improve it. And I think we need to think of three ways. Certainly a citizen initiative, and I think we can also ask that there be a real constitutional convention after we become a state to look at amending it and changing it. So again, thank you to um, uh, the people who brought us here today, and we look forward to a wonderful vote in November. Thank you, Ms. Hart. <laughs> just, just a quick note. Uh, uh, on the poster that we actually distributed, it's pictures on it. Oh, and uh, it was actually by, uh, graciously done by Julie, who was attended one of our uh, forums. Thank you very much. Ms. Brown. We'll be followed by John Pincus, Deborah Prindle, and then Mary Lord. I'm Janet Brown, and I've been active in the statehood movement for about the last four or five years. Uh, but I've been conscious of it ever since I came here uh, to get married in 1957. Uh, I felt at the time that I had been robbed, as I said a couple of weeks ago here, uh, of my citizenship. Um, I am, uh, I feel very grateful, and we all should, to the mayor for taking the lead on this. Um, we wouldn't be where we are today, and I am um, really pleased to see how much interest has grown, and maybe it was here in the city all the time simmering as it has been for me, but the number of people and the variety of organizations that have come out here to testify is a very fine testimony to the validity of the issue and to the leadership of our mayor. I, I uh, am not disturbed by the number of proposed changes, many of them contradictory one to another. Uh, I am not concerned really about the details. I have lots of problems with the, with the Constitution, but I'm not in a position uh, to do anything about it. I don't have the knowledge or the background. But I think it is absolutely essential, as Eleanor Hart has suggested on more than one occasion, that we have an amendment process uh, that, that needs to be very clear in the Constitution. And because the amount of time that the mayor has been confined to between now and November for the city to get busy on these things, we have an unreasonably short time to weigh the Constitution. So I think the amendment process is absolutely necessary and we need to have um, an explicit call uh, in the Constitution for a uh, constitutional convention in say four to six weeks, that would, uh, four to six years, that would give us two elections and the experience of it. And then to have a, a citizen elected constitutional convention with all the proper investment and resources for the commission, for the lawyers, uh, because we won't, won't all be lawyers on that committee, uh, on the, that convention, and then take a thorough review and get us the final product that we want. I personally uh, probably won't be around in four years, but I am willing to take the chance that we'll get a better constitution and we'll be happier with it if we have a review in four years. So let's give us the statehood vote by all means, and we'll act on it in November. We're grateful to you who are working on it, but give us a specific amendment that calls for a state con uh, convention four years from now. Thank you. John Pincus, followed by. Everything I want to say has been covered by prior speakers. Call the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you.
Deborah Prindle, followed by Mary Lord. Acknowledging my shortness, I represent short people. <laughs> Good morning. I think it's still morning. Um, thank you for providing this opportunity for us to have this kind of convention, this kind of hearing. Um, I've been a homeowner in Ward 3 since 1985, 31 years. Um, I also have a doctorate in city and regional planning and master's degrees in economics and public administration. So that is the perspective that I'm going to bring to my comments. Um, uh, the focus of much of the testimony this morning has been on the many political advantages of statehood and national representation in Congress, and I fully share them. And like many of the other speakers, I've been extremely frustrated over the years at being unable to write or influence uh, anyone in Congress who would represent me as a DC um, resident. However, uh, I am concerned, as many others are, about the rush to pass a constitution. Um, and I de devoutly feel that the devil is in the details in this case. Um, I'm particularly dismayed and disappointed by the absence of concern over the financial and economic burden on taxpayers in the drafting of the Constitution. We are not a typical place to have a state. We are extremely small geographic area, and some of the comparisons that have been made to other states, I don't uh, agree with. Uh, we have a very large portion of our limited territory which is covered by tax-exempt uses. Government monuments, government functions, religious institutions, and so forth. So the, the, tax, the true tax base of the future state would be extremely small and limited. And I think what we need to have, and I want to call for this, is a solid economic and financial analysis of the budgetary demands on taxpayers of the proposed constitution, especially any proposed loss of federal funding and any additional government costs for an expanded size of government um, uh, in this draft and in any future iterations of future drafts. Um, I particularly want to draw attention to the many comments that people have made about calling for an expanded legislative branch. Um, uh, there are huge costs involved with that, and people really, not just for the elections, but for the salaries, the office support, the other expenses that would go with those functions. People really need a solid analysis of that. I see your point, 30 seconds, yes. Then also on the judicial branch, I understand um, that uh, the proposed draft would take away a lot of the federal funding for judicial functions um, that would remain uh, very substantial in our territory, um, even as a state. So uh, since we are not a typical location, since we have the presence of national government, which will continue to attract terrorists, crowds, and the theft opportunities inherent in large crowd control, uh, the, the cost to us of a judicial system and crime and um, uh, incarceration and so forth should be fairly apportioned. Uh, the federal government should contribute to this. And I think that what we need to do in drafting a constitution is look uh, at the, the uh, proposed increases in cost to taxpayers and the proposed losses in revenue and, and have a solid conversation about that. That should not be undiscussed. Thank you very much. Yeah. Mary Lord, followed by Donald Haynes, and then our last speaker. Thank you. Uh, first, I want to thank Mayor Bowser and the council and our senators and representatives for this opportunity to engage in probably the best civics lesson I've had in a long time. The spirit of 76 is right here and alive in the District of Columbia. My name is Mary Lord. I currently serve uh, as the at-large member on the D.C. State Board of Education. As I like to say, I volunteered in my children's nursery school and things just kind of got out of hand. And I as a member of the State Board of Education and my colleague from Ward 3, Ruth Wattenberg, is here, um, have the uh, privilege of setting graduation requirements that would require every graduate of the District of Columbia to study DC history, which is our civics lesson, to study American history, just like most of the children in all the other states do. So I'm here to actually 
specifically address Article 2, Section 7B2, which establishes the District of Columbia State Board of Education in the Constitution. This is incredibly important because it means that the legislature cannot, with a flick of the pen, take away our rights as citizens to determine the education of our children. In other states, uh, there have been moves and successful moves to abolish their state boards of education. Um, but this comes with a big caveat. The powers and authorities in the Constitution strip the Board of Education to serving as merely an advisory board to the state superintendent of education. We no longer can set graduation requirements. We no longer can adopt the standards that have succeeded in raising graduation rates, four-year on-time graduation rates, to the highest they have ever been in the history of the city. They, um, lay, they strip us of the ability to lay the foundation for success for every student. They have, um, and it would, it would severely undermine and politicize education in a way that would be detrimental to children. So um, I totally support the process, but I think there, uh, as the previous speaker said, the devil is in the details. The other thing I would like to say, as a previous speaker, speaker mentioned, was to build on the state level authorities we already have. I served as president of the National Association of State Boards of Education last year, and I'm currently the immediate past president. And because we are members of a state board, we have all the powers and authorities, your voice was at the table when the rewrite of federal education law took place. So I would like to find a way to essentially establish more state level boards that we can then build on to go and rove the halls of Congress with people who actually do have a vote. Thank you very much for this opportunity and thank you all for being here. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm Donald Haynes. I'm a, been a resident of Ward 6 since 1975. I want to address three specific issues just because they, I think they are ones that have not necessarily been touched on or I have a perspective to add. First, I want to talk about the problem of the legislature's size, and I'm a late convert. I think we're, we're hearing the beginning of a gelling compromise. I was one of those strongly opposed to keeping the council at 13 and keeping the legislature as the council at 13. But I think the, the rationale, I suggest we go to three phases. The first phase is an immediate transition phase, and that would be upon the date of statehood, we have a, basically a name change as the Constitution provides. The council becomes the House of Delegates, the chairman becomes the speaker, the mayor becomes the governor. I'd add a lieutenant governor like Maryland so that the governor and lieutenant governor run as a team and have the lieutenant governor simply appointed by the governor because that's how the governor, that's how the lieutenant governor is selected. Um, in addition, I would have the judges uh, do the same thing. And I would also initial, initially say that the elected shadow senators and delegate and senators and representative will take their seats in Congress as as the members of the voting electorate in DC have intended from the beginning and that all of these offices will stay only until the first general election after we become statehood and then we would be under under whatever the Constitution is and then the also in the Constitution would be this provision for an automatic four years, I prefer six, maybe we compromise on five, constitutional convention. I am strongly opposed to the idea of individual citizens or so-called groups of citizens being able to propose initiatives to change the Constitution. What that means is we end up like California, where extremist groups or more likely corporate funded groups um, do bogus, uh, so we have Proposition 8 to eliminate eliminate anti-discrimination causes, or people against a bottle tax or in favor of a bottle tax, all, all use our resources to play out. On, on, the, on the amendment process itself, I think it's too easy now. Right now, a bare majority of the council can change the constitution with a bare, bare vote. It ought to be two thirds of the council, and it ought to require two votes, two general elections, so that, so that the constitution provides a check on the, on the temporary mood um, that happens. And then in addition, the judiciary ought to be more like our judiciary. 
Every judge that now serves DC, some of them good judges, every judge lacks one thing, a vote by a single DC voting person in Congress. So we, we ought to have them, I think judges should not be subject to any election, continue the judicial nomination process and leave it with uh, the mayor's appointment uh, subject confirmation by the House of Delegates, but for a lifetime tenured job, that's the protection for all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I saw Ruth Wattenberg earlier, or word? Ruth Wattenberg, no? Okay. Sure, you wanna? Yeah, uh, this is just a housekeeping matter. My uh, trusty assistant, Rachel, who works her tail off for me, has lost her wallet. So if anybody finds a blue wallet, can you please uh, bring it to our attention? Thank you. Okay. That, uh, that concludes our uh, witness list of speakers who have uh, signed up. Uh, I'm gonna turn the uh, gavel back over to our mayor to. Well, I wanna I'll thank everybody. Close. We are reaching the, the close of our, our constitutional convention and I wanna thank everyone for your participation. I, I had jotted down a couple of notes or some things that I've heard and observed over the last several days and indeed the last several weeks that we've been talking about um, the Constitution and the advisory referendum. Uh, and I think I want to start with the first thing is that there is a lot that we all agree on. And I think that the, the sentiment uh, that we have a, a unique time right now that needs to be taken advantage of uh, is resonant across all of the days of our discussion. I've heard a lot of questions about uh, process and how we could do better, should have done better, or will do better. Uh, and I have also been having a lot of thoughts of my own about what was the process like before in 82 or 87, what was the result. Certainly there were probably some discussions then about how the process could be different, could be better, will be better, uh, even then. I don't know about that process because I wasn't around for that process. Uh, but I imagine that there was a lot of vigorous debate, uh, including around the name of New Columbia. Uh, one of the legal advisory team uh, went and researched the actual documents from that convention uh, and described the long, robust process of coming up with that name that was agreed to by a constitutional convention and voted on by the voters. So that just tells us a process uh, that some talk about now as if it were perfect, which it maybe it was, probably wasn't, uh, came up with the name New Columbia. Uh, so today we talk about and we debate uh, a number of things that, uh, that are part of, of this process. We also want to look at what, what have been uh, the results uh, of, of process and a lot of years of talking about statehood, which takes me to my third point. You're going to hear me say this a lot, uh, this, this phrase, that urgency has a shelf life. And I get concerned and when I think back of what must have happened in 82 and 87, that there was a lot of rigorous debate. Uh, and then there was no win uh, and a lot of rigorous debate and talk, uh, but not concrete actions. So I ask that we all focus on what type of commitment are we willing to make for a sustained effort that gets us to a win and gets us to real action. What is that amount of time? Is it seven months? Is it seven years? Is it three years? Are we all going to be sitting here next year at this time with the same amount of energy? I don't know. But I want us to think as we move forward, and this is my message to the delegates, uh, this will be my message to the council, and my message to the voters. How, what is the amount of time um, that we all can commit to a high level sustained effort, not only within our boundaries, but across our nation? Uh, and so that is what has driven all of us to be sitting here. So a number of people have said that the mayor's done this and we're happy about it, but I'm, I'm only a vessel. 
I, I am acting on what you told me to do. Uh, certainly, when I went around all eight wards of the District of Columbia, people are focused more focused than I have seen in all of my years of elective life about the indignity of our lack of having a vote in the Congress. People, and Mark Pockin said it a couple of times, will do something when we're personally insulted by what is happening. I'm personally insulted by what is happening. My level of personal insult started a few years ago when we were literally traded in a budget deal. Literally traded in a budget deal. I couldn't believe it then. I understood it. I know what our leaders have to do when they have to get things done for our whole country and they're, faced, they're sitting across the negotiation table. I understood it, but it still made me mad. I, a number of you have gone to jail for DC statehood, right? Have you? Who has? I have gone to jail for DC statehood and I had no intention of going to jail for DC <laughs> statehood when I woke up that morning. None whatsoever. But I was indeed personally insulted by what I saw. Now as mayor, the level of personal insult is even more dramatic because it is true. Jack is right, we are a state. We function like a state. There is no mayor in the, in the United States that has the power to affect citizens that I have as mayor. None. We are not like any other city. And so we do have to, the way we are different, we're different in a very critical way. And this is why uh, my friend Anise would tell me that I don't know why you all are going for this incremental voting rights business. I don't know why you're doing it. But she's right. Because even if we get one vote or two votes in the House, there's nothing like having two senators. It makes a difference in terms of our ability to impact the laws that affect us and impact the budget uh, that goes down to all states. We are in a great position to have this conversation right now. And I do agree that we have to educate, fire up, our own residents and we do have to explain to them because sometimes when life is good you think well hey nothing is wrong with the status quo in Washington you know they pick up my trash the schools are improving people are moving here you know my taxes are even going down not so bad in Washington why do we need to shake things up because we are always at the whim of the Congress we are always at the whim of the Congress so Mr. Plotkin said a little bit earlier, I should never talk to any members of the Congress without talking about statehood. Trust me, Mark Plotkin has no idea what I talk to the members of Congress about. Uh, now, sometimes I'll come out and tell them, sometimes I won't, uh, because those conversations are critical. Uh, but in each time, we don't go and only talk to the Democrats, because uh, the fact is the Republicans have say over us. Imagine that, listen to that statement. Somebody from Utah has say over us. Somebody from North Carolina has say over us. Somebody from Wisconsin, Florida, Texas, you name it, has a say over what our elected representatives do. And so time after time, uh, they will say to me, one of them said, you know, never gonna happen. I know you're working on statehood, never going to happen. Time after time to have to time after time. So these people um, will tell us that they're our friends and, you know, they, they think that they are. And we have to remind them uh, that they are not. So uh, I just want to ask everybody, and I respect all of what I heard, and, I, and I've heard all of what I heard. And I, I have really, I shouldn't say I heard it, I, I really listened uh, to what I heard. And I, this is the discussion that we will be uh, having among the commissioners. So if the argument is let's take longer, let's just not take, 
longer <laughs> for the sake of taking longer. Let's think about what we would actually get out of taking longer. Or can we get all of the things that we've heard taken care of in the time uh, that I think that it will be most impactful? I also heard a lot about making sure that the Constitution uh, enshrines or doesn't get rid of any checks and balances in our jurisdiction. Uh, and I assure you uh, that uh, I will only support something that does enshrine those checks and balances. Not from the Congress, though. And so that's what's different about what's before us. Uh, we can, I heard some questions about do the elected AG and being under the governor. That's not in this, in this Constitution. Uh, the elected AG continues to be elected in this Constitution. The AG uh, in our system and the way we're set up is part of the executive, just like the CFO is a part of the executive, just like the IG is part of the executive. That's not saying they're subordinate to the mayor. Uh, that is saying that they serve an executive function, not a legislative function, not a judicial function, but part of an executive function, and that continues to be enshrined here. Uh, it was also uh, very important to many people that the State Board of Education uh, is included. Uh, that there are also some parts uh, of the government uh, that the Congress, the federal government, has more say over what happens than, than we do, or too much say, um, including uh, how we write our zoning laws. Uh, and so those uh, also are, are taken care of by, the, by our state government and not by the congressional body. Now, the, amends, uh, the amendments to the Constitution, I think there have been some very constructive um, recommendations done here, and I look forward to having uh, this conversation um, with the members of, of the commission. I also want to, uh, to emphasize what I heard about communications and funding and sustaining the effort uh, because this has been quite a lot. Uh, we uh, established in the government for the first time a regional affairs uh, office that is led by Beverly Perry and I want to give her a big round of applause for her federal and regional work. And uh, somebody said that we should have started this last year, but we did start this last year when we created that office um, so that we would have a focus in the mayor's office on our relationships with the Congress, on our relationships with the federal agencies, and indeed um, our, our, our effort um, to chart a new course uh, for statehood, which is what, what is underway now. I also heard a lot about voting uh, and making sure that uh, the principles of one person and having uh, access to the ballot box and one person, one vote, uh, and having competitive elections. And I think that has uh, been uh, raised a number of times. And finally, I'll I'll say this, uh, that uh, we, and we heard uh, uh, Jamie Raskin, and I was so pleased that he was able to come and offer his perspective, and I hope that we all pay attention uh, to what Jamie said. He is an ally, uh, he's a constitutional uh, scholar, and he uh, will be more than anybody able uh, to, to help us advance the cause of statehood. He emphasized the urgency of now. He emphasize having a streamlined conversation, uh, a streamlined constitution, uh, and uh, he emphasized making sure uh, that we are gaining allies in every place that we can across our country. Uh, I think that was uh, significantly important. I am really very proud of uh, all of you for staying the course on statehood for as long as you have, and I owe it we owe it, and we all owe it to our fellow citizens uh, to make sure that, that we're moving forward. Sometimes we decry the people who are not here when we need to celebrate the people who are and then figure out how to get everybody else in the room. Uh, so with that, if there's no further discussion uh, among the members of the commission, uh, I would like to uh, adjourn the New Columbia Statehood Commission and constitute Constitutional Convention of 2016. 
We now return to our previously scheduled program, already in progress.